10 years gonna, and that doesn't worry me I know I can play good enough golf Don't miss the panel every Saturday afternoon only on Off The Ball OTB Sports Radio. It is half past seven on this Monday morning. You're very welcome along to OTB AM. I would say it's a regular two hour show for you this morning, but it's going to be anything but regular. We're going to have the usual coronavirus updates over the course of the first hour or so of the show. We're going to have a couple of guests talking to us about how their businesses have been affected, sports related guests. Uh, and then for the last hour or so, or the last 45 minutes at least, uh, we will turn the coronavirus tap off for you this morning uh, and turn our attention towards the Classic Game Club. It's our podcast series that's been running for the duration of 2020 so far. We're going to ratchet this up a little bit over the next few weeks. Today's edition is Meath against Cork, the 1990 All-Ireland Football Final of the Year. Cork did the double. A fantastic morning for any Cork GA fans joining us. We would love to hear from you this morning. You can tweet us at Off The Ball. You can get in touch with what you're doing, what have you been getting up to over the course of the weekend, uh, any stories or anecdotes uh, from lockdown over the past couple of days. As I say, it's not a regular show. Nathan Murphy should be in this seat this morning, but instead uh, he's at home. How are you getting on, Nathan? Uh, we're all right. We're all right. We're we're getting there. It's a bit unusual, I think, to say the least. Does it feel like day three at the moment, or day three hundred? <laughs> no, it feels very much like day three hundred. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be a long, long few weeks, I think, for everybody for a whole manner of reasons. Well, what's your household been like over the last few days? <laughs> uh, well, there's a bit of a novelty factor to it at the moment, but uh, trying to tell three kids that they can't meet up with their friends or they can't go about their daily life is a uh, is a bit weird, so it's a lot of time spent trying to work out uh, sort of timetables of amusement. There's been a lot of table tennis. Okay. Uh, my wife, fair play to her, uh, just out of pure luck, had bought a little uh, nice little table tennis set that you can attach to your own kitchen table, uh, which if anybody's watching, I would heartily recommend buying. So we have a, a morning table tennis competition and quite often an afternoon <laughs> table tennis competition. There have been tears every morning so far, <laughs> uh, but I'm hoping they may stop at some stage. There have been colouring competitions. You name it, it's a competition, which is uh, a dangerous route to go down because uh, somebody ends up crying. I'm really, often me. I'm really jealous of your kids. <laughs> that they get the uh, morning table tennis competition. The morning table tennis uh, competition sounds absolutely fantastic. I'm not going to lie. I, I'm just trying to stay away from buying a PlayStation for as long as as possible. I hear you. Because that, that'd be the easy answer, but uh, yeah, let's try and avoid that. Because of, of course, buying a PlayStation would be just for your kids and definitely not just to satisfy your oh, own well, well, exa Exactly, yeah. Ve perilously close to installing the, actually no, not perilously close, I downloaded 15% of Fortnite last Thursday on my uh, PC. Oh. I, I, don't, I don't know if you can actually even play it, but I just saw that there was like a Mac version and I stopped myself. I was like, no, this is, at the time it was day one. It was like, this is, this is too soon. Give me another few weeks of this before I actually delve into the world of Fortnite. It, like, I think I speak for a lot of people here. Once you start on something like that, you will not be able to stop. You, we, we will never be able to, to come out of the funk we will find ourselves in if we start at something like Football Manager or Fortnite or something like that. What, what have you been doing? What, what has Nathan Murphy been doing to keep himself busy rather than just his kids? Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, when you have three kids under eight, uh, your that, entire that day pretty much goes into... Up. So there's... Yeah, it's... Uh, Watch a movie at night, so mm. what have I watched so far? Last night I watched the first Lego movie again. Which okay. the Le have you watched the Lego movies? I've seen the first one. Excellent. Uh, well, the second one is actually better. Is it? But I watched the first one again. The uh, second, second one is quality. So it's by second one I mean the Lego movie part two. Mm. So not Lego Batman, which is technically the second one. But, uh, which is also good, because Batman's probably the best character in the Lego movies. Well, but uh, I would... True I, that. I watched The Lion King uh, the night before that, the new version of The Lion King, which is rather bizarre because it's the exact same movie. Just live person. action. Just live action, which, while, while impressive, I would have thought maybe they might have tried something a little bit different. Mm. Uh, yeah, there's been, what else have I watched? Uh, the Smurfs movie. Okay, how's that? Not great, not great. Kids loved it, but mm. there's no real, no real adult side to it at all. So any recommendations out there, uh, please. I'm open. Trying to get kids to watch something new is difficult. So like, I'm, I've, I've never seen Star Wars, so I'm trying to convince them to sit and watch all the Star Wars, but that's just, it's just difficult. Or watch all the Harry Potters. Get into something. 
Yeah, that would be. I, a... I've also I also have visions of. Uh, I've been telling them like maybe they could learn the guitar over the next couple of months. Okay. Or learn Spanish or something and come out of this, in uh, with something positive. But uh, they have shown little interest in that so far. That that is the thing. Yeah, uh, like uh, if there's a couple of bad aspects to social media at the moment. First of all, is the the, the the rumors and stuff that you see around social media that is obviously bad. But second of all, is the pressure it is putting on people. It is like in the year of fourteen hundred and something, William Shakespeare was uh, quarantined and wrote King Lear, or uh, <laughs> Isaac Newton invented the theory of gravity while quarantined or something like that. There's a lot of pressure on us to actually achieve something good. The guitar might actually be up there. It's a good shout. Um, well, what have you been doing? I've been watching a lot of Dream Team, which uh, ha is something that I've quickly realised is not the best way to spend some time. But I'm in there. I've started writing pieces for Off the Ball on this, so I'm kind of a little bit in too deep to actually uh, undo this at the moment. Watching a lot of Better Call Saul, which is okay. uh, I, I just can't believe I haven't done this before. Really, uh, it's outrageous that a Breaking Bad fan could even have been left off the hook not watching this thing because it is funnier than Breaking Bad. I would say even in the early stages, if you compare early season to early seasons, it's better than Breaking Bad. And we want to have a little bit more of that uh, as the weeks go on. So I think Jura's binge watching that as well at the moment. But as Nathan said, we'd love to hear your recommendations. Tweet us at Off The Ball. Tweet us personally if you want. What have you been watching? What have you you've been binging on? Of course, over the course of last night, we've been watching a bit of uh, 90s football. We will have more on that later on when Tommy Rooney will be joining us for a classic game club. Let us tell you the full schedule of what's coming up this morning. Uh, on, uh, on OTB AM. Uh, the running order this morning is uh, looking something like this. Sports pages coming your way at uh, 20 to 8 this morning. Uh, the GEA Impact then. Brian Farrell and Paul Ganey will be joining us after 8 o'clock. Former Mead footballer and of course Kerry, current Kerry footballer. Both publicans will be telling us about the impact in their business that the coronavirus has had over the last few days. Uh, the sports news with Tom Malone coming your way at half past 8. And then the classic game club uh, at 8.45 uh, this morning. It's Cork against Mead in the 1990 All-Ireland Final. Just to tell you what's coming up today in sport, there is ridiculously live sport to tell you about because Emmett Brennan will face a Swiss opponent in the last 16 of the Olympic qualifiers in London today. The Dublin Docklands boxing club man. Uh, he needs a top six finish to qualify for Tokyo. Uh, he's back uh, in action tomorrow. St. Patrick's Day against Switzerland. Uh, UK Smalley. Uh, he was joined in the last 16 by Tala Lightweight, George Bates and Dublin heavyweight uh, Kareel uh, Afana Saval. And today in London, Aidan Walsh and Michael Nevin are fighting for places in the last 16 with all bouts behind closed doors from now on. Brendan Irvine, Carly McNall and Kurt Walker are fighting for places in the last day of qualifying. Now in football, Pan Manchester United's Paul Pogba has pledged financial support to help fight the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, he set up a, a fundraising page on Facebook and said he'll double the amount raised if the £27,000 target is reached. Uh, now former Manchester City defender Eliki Mangala is one of five Valencia players and staff to test positive uh, for coronavirus. Uh, Ezekiel Garay is another and Mangala says he's self-isolating and the club says all the individuals are in good health. A couple of other stories to tell you about. Uh, the Rugby Union Premiership season is expected to be suspended. Uh, a meeting set to take place today to discuss the best way forward for league fixtures due to coronavirus concerns. Of course, the United Kingdom have yet to do what we have done. And in terms of banning uh, public gatherings of, of huge numbers like that, the final round of Six Nations matches were postponed, of course. Uh, World Cup winner uh, Will Greenwood, uh, you can check out his comments on offtheball.com if you want to see his. He says basically there will be an opportunity to play Saturday's fixtures on the 31st of October. Uh, and then in snooker, Joe Trump has made history in winning snooker's Gibraltar Open last night. The world number one beat Kyron Wilson 4-3 in the decider to become the first player to win six ranking titles in a single season. The final was played behind closed doors due to the coronavirus, with Trump picking up £50,000 in prize money as well as £150,000. Uh, you can contact us as well this morning on WhatsApp, I should say. It's 87 180 That's 87 180 Time for the papers. OCB AM. We'll start with offtheball.com first this morning. He was called Judas, Jack Charlton's complicated relationship with Ireland. Ross Whitaker was on Off the Ball over the course of the weekend chatting about his Italian 90 doc. It's absolutely fantastic. Worth checking out the interview as well. Definitely worth your time as well. Up on YouTube right now, or as I say, on offtheball.com. Right, let's start through some of the back pages this morning. I'm going to start with the Irish Daily Mail this morning because this has obviously been a big story that's doing the rounds over the last 24 hours. Fury could be hit 
with eight-year ban. A UK anti-doping set to open new probe after a claim member of his team offered Farmer £25,000 to lie about failed drugs tests. So this is a story that the Irish Mail on Sunday obviously uh, led with and had as an exclusive yesterday. Uh, so if anybody's missed this, basically the story this morning is that UCAT are poised to open a new investigation uh, into Tyson Fury and his cousin Huey because explosive allegations about a member of their team offered a farmer 25 grand to lie about how the pair failed dope tests in 2015. So this is with regards to nandrolone potentially being uh, contaminated in meat. The allegation, I should say that it is an allegation, uh, is that a farmer was paid to lie about nandrolone being in the meat. So interesting to see what the UCAN investigation shows up. Also very, very interesting to, to hear what the Fury response will be. Frank Warren has come out and categorically denied this story. He has rubbish it, has said it is completely ridiculous. So it's important to put that out there at the moment today. <clears throat> completely deny this. Uh, the other story in the back of the Irish Daily Mail, which might miss people's attention today, is that FAI to approve rescue deal by email. Philip Quinn reporting that the 50 million euro rescue deal uh, for the FAI is to be approved by email today. It was, of course, supposed to be agreed in person in the Castle Knock Hotel. 79 delegates putting them in a room wouldn't be very safe, so they're going to try and do it over email today. Gary Owens last night uh, requested them to do it. He says that it is essential that this council sanction is received tomorrow, so that's today, to keep the association alive. So the, the full terms of the deal entail extending the maturity date of the primary 28.5 million loan on the Aviva Stadium borrowings from 2021 to 2030. On top of that then, an upfront 14 million loan is being supplied for cash flow purposes and uh, that'll be repaid at 25 or 2.5 million euros, excuse me, per annum uh, directly from the UEFA centralised TV deal. And then there is also the option until December 2021 of increasing this loan by 10 million euro. So I'm not sure that you see this coming, Nathan. Uh, like this is obviously a, a story that we've that hasn't exactly been front and centre over the last few weeks. But this is obviously a deal that needs to be signed, sealed, and delivered. And today is the day to do it. Well, I think the FAI realises there's a real rush on this because we're in totally uncharted territory mm. where the government are dipping into essentially all their savings funds. They've gone into the Brexit fund and they're throwing absolutely everything at fighting this outbreak. So if the FAI don't have that in writing, you can understand why they're in a bit of a rush to get it done because obviously this is still a, listen, it's a worrying time for everybody in any form of employment and the FAI need to get these funds in just for pure cash flow purposes. This obviously won't do very much for League of Ireland clubs, uh, which you know we can get on to later. Uh, the treasurer of Sligo Rovers was on with Neil Tracy on Saturday and was very interesting in terms of just their cash flow issues that will come up very, very quickly. And Sligo, a very well-run club. But I just think for FAI, for clubs, like this is where UEFA and FIFA need to step up. These are two incredibly wealthy organisations. And that's going to be one of the interesting things to follow over the next few weeks. You know, do UEFA, do the governing bodies step in and help the weaker clubs, the weaker leagues, and make sure that they survive? Or is it going to be a survival of the fittest in sport? Yeah, it'll be very, very interesting to see what does happen over the next few weeks. Uh, one of the interesting things from the paper today is just kind of a cut down on the amount of supplements available. Irish Examiner usually has a separate sports section every morning. And uh, naturally now, I've just gone back into the rest of the paper because there is a lack of sport uh, to report on. And they do say there are strange days uh, in worrying times and uh, positional switch for Examiner Sport. Applause now reserved for medical heroes is the, the top line here. Dermot Corrigan reporting on a fairly grim situation in Madrid at the moment. And damn the begrudgers, we've had a great season no matter how it finishes. So this is a, a Liverpool perspective on how the season has gone. Obviously, the potential for the season to be called off and postponed or whatever way you want to look at it, depending if you're Karen Brady or Jurgen Klopp, there are varying degrees of whether or not you want the season called off. We'll get into that shortly. Just to go through the rest of the back pages, the back page of the Irish Sun, Four teams, five days, one stadium. UEFA's quickfire idea for European competitions to be fully completed. So this could be almost a, a mini tournament to complete the UEFA Champions League and Europa League this summer. The Champions League would take place in Istanbul. The Europa League would take place in Gdansk. And it'll be played over the course of uh, a little mini tournament, really. Alan Shearer then writing, Premier no Prem KO is last option. But if so, no title or drop. We'll get Nathan's take on that in just a moment. Uh, the Daily Telegraph uh, inside their main uh, newspaper section as well this morning. UEFA moves to save Champions League. As I mentioned there, the semi-finals and final could be staged over four days. One last punch-up. Castleford beat St. Helens in probably the final rugby league game for a while. And US to bid for T20 World Cup as co-hosts. And players fear for future after virus shutdown. 
moving on to the Guardian then this morning. They lead with that fairly striking picture from Brazil last night. Masked fury in Brazil. Grêmio players protest in striking fashion over having to play amid virus pandemic. And then they also have that Tyson Fury story. UCAD posed to investigate boxer over farmer's meat claim. The Irish Daily Star then. Declan's careless kickabout. Rice practice despite coronavirus order against Pal Mount. So uh, a passerby yesterday spotted two figures playing a bit of football in the training ground and discovered that Mason Mount was one of the footballers playing about a ball with his buddy Declan Rice. Of course, Mason Mount uh, is supposed to be self-isolating at the moment after Callum hudson Adoy tested positive for coronavirus. Uh, Idiots is the headline there, as you can see in the UK version of the Star this morning. They've gone for a harder line. Carlo Kane has an exclusive here with former Derry star pra- Paddy Bradley. Mixed messages, a big problem. So this is between the mixed messages north and south of the border over the coronavirus. He says they are crazy. Uh, he's a secondary school teacher and he cannot understand why educational institutions in the UK and Northern Ireland have not been closed yet, despite GEA clubs all over the co- country going into lockdown. Uh, the Herald this morning goes with Euro loser. UEFA asked to postpone finals. And 30 years of hurt, Irish trio looked back at the 1990 season when Liverpool last won the league. The Mirror then goes with the Mason Mount story as well. Selfish isolation. And Rooney says we're guinea pigs. This is Wayne Rooney in the Sunday Times yesterday, wondering why footballers were used as guinea pigs and initially asked to play last weekend. Begovic then says we must finish the season and bring joy. Players demanding that football authorities find a way to finish this season. The Irish Independent then. GEA warn of stark risks facing players who defy a blanket ban. So club or inter-county teams that continue to train during the 17-day 17, 17 suspension of GEA activity will not be insured, putting players at considerable risk. Uh, a picture there of uh, a lock in front of Crow Park. The Irish Times then this morning, leading with a photo from the boxing yesterday. Incredible that that is still continuing to go ahead. Boxing qualifiers continue, but uncertainty still for many athletes, writes Ian O'Reardon. Situation in athletics complicated by the introduction of new qualifying criteria. While Malachy Clerken says lockdown will highlight how important sport is in our lives. And Van Dijk fears winning title in empty stadium, which is looking like a possibility for Liverpool at this point. And then finally for now, the London Times uh, Fury faces new drug probe. Key witness claims he lied to anti-doping officials. Warren says allegations are outrageous. You've got the photographs there of Brazilian team Gremio wearing masks in coronavirus protest. And you have to complete the season, says Greg Dyke. And Nathan, we may go straight into this story on the back of it because there's clearly a lot of vested interests at play here. Karen Brady, mm-hmm. the, the one and the strongest voice really to kind of step out of line and say, now we should actually just wrap things up or just void everything, I should say, for this season, which is obviously convenient given West Ham United are in a bit of relegation trouble. Like, uh, you've got Greg Dyke, you've got um, his successor, Greg Clark, saying that he's going to tell clubs that he believes it will be unfeasible to finish the season. So you don't just have Karen Brady saying this, you do have someone like Greg Clark saying this might not actually happen, getting this whole thing finished. It may well be unfeasible to finish the season because we don't know how long this is going to last. And if we get deep into the summer, when are you going to finish the season? And for Greg Dyke saying you must finish the season, I think it's way too early to say you've got to do anything right now. We just don't know where we're going to be in a month, in two months' time. So the Premier League, it seems, are going to make a decision this week. And any decision that goes with continuing to play or intending to play games behind closed doors... like. They're going to have to come back to that, you'd imagine, in times to come. And this idea of playing behind closed doors seems to ignore, and it touches on what Rain Rooney said yesterday, seems to ignore the fact that, firstly, as we've seen from Spain, that this disease can affect anybody, that it can affect players, it can affect their family members, that they're just going to turn up 11 v 11 and rock on and play the game for our entertainment and deal with the consequences as if it's somehow going to affect them slightly differently. Like That's just not going to happen. And also, and this was shown in the PGA Tour, where they intended to play on behind closed doors. It's not just 11 v 11. You've got management, backroom staff, and from a broadcaster's point of view, I'm sure dozens upon dozens of people. So suddenly you're very quickly into... 100, 150 people into a stadium and suddenly you're into a mass gathering again where people can't stay that far apart. So to suggest we can just go back, I think, in two months' time playing these games behind closed doors, I just don't think it's a runner at all. 
the one possibility that the Premier League could go and the Champions League is, I would imagine, uh, something that maybe the Premier League might think about as well, of running it off over four or five days whenever you can. So do you look at the league table and there's so many politics involved in all this and you, you talk about Karen Brady. Like, when Karen Brady talks about voiding the season, does she intend to give Sky back the $120 million that they got mm. in the broadcasting rights? Absolutely not. They intend to keep all the money for the season and make sure they're getting it again next season. I've seen a 22 team league proposed where Leeds and West Brom will come in that there's no relegation like all, everything is going to be on the table over the next while the most obvious pressing issue is what they do with Liverpool and whether they give them the title <laughs> right now it sort of feels irrelevant it feels like the sort of age of banter is going to be put on pause for a yeah. little while and a lot of what has been spoken about with Liverpool is the sort of banter side of things of Manchester United Manchester City supporters can they sort of get one over on Liverpool, I, in one way, it feels like it doesn't really matter. If you put a giant asterisk, I think everybody's going to remember and recognise that Liverpool should have won the title. They're 25 points clear. It's not like at this stage they're going to win the title the way they want to, which is in front of a, a packed house like they might have this weekend against Crystal Palace. It's not like they're going to have that open top parade anytime soon. But there's no question they are the champions and like, could you look at a situation where you look down the league and say all right Liverpool are champions Manchester City and Leicester City get into Europe next season and then it's very tight below that and you have a six-team tournament to get the final Champions League spot and maybe if some sort of an eight-team tournament for relegation you see the the relegate the teams in the bottom half they all will want it to be null and void and just rock on next season and keep things going so there's probably what's there is no right thing to do at the moment, but I, I could definitely see a situation. I'd say the most likely scenario right now is that they just void the season. I wonder is there I mean, a possibility, or I, I don't wonder, I think it's definitely going to be the case, if football comes back in the next couple of months, that it just becomes a hierarchy of which has the most money associated with it. So. Mm. Champions League has got the most money going around for it, so that will be the first in line to get its little mini tournament sorted. So you'll get rid of two legged ties, you'll just have them played off in a sort of March Madness type thing in the middle of the summer, potentially, as I say, if football comes back. Then the next thing down the, the, the line will be the Premier League finishing it up, or at least finishing it to the point where Liverpool are clear winners and have it mathematically wrapped up. And then you kind of go down the rung as well, where the FA Cup will probably just be scrapped entirely. And then you kind of have this in international window like that. Like I would be astonished at this point if it is not Euro 2021. There can't be any feasible way how Euro 2020 goes ahead in this climate. Uh, no, there's absolutely no chance, uh, particularly because that it's in 12 different countries and the sheer amount of travelling that's that's going to take place. So yeah, you're right. It will be a hierarchy and it's a similar situation uh, going back to golf in that. It looks as though all four majors are probably going to be postponed. Are they going to be just that asterisk, which again I wouldn't have a big issue with, or does money talk? And actually, when golf hopefully returns, say August, September, do you have four majors in the space of six weeks? Because that's mm. where the most money is. So it'll be a similar situation. The Champions League will definitely take precedence, but how long can you go on for? So if you have the Champions League and you're going to have three or four games in the space of four or five days, there's a week gone. Yeah. If the Premier League, a lot of the teams still have what? nine ten games left at a minimum that's going to take five weeks to run off like next thing you're into next september now when rooney touched on it maybe you just reshape the calendar in the build-up to the 2022 world cup and you use this opportunity now to do that and i'd imagine nothing is really off the table at the moment but it, 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 it right now it really doesn't seem feasible to play off the final 10 games of the premier league season and if that's the case how can you relegate any teams mm. and if you're not going to have relegation can you have a champion as you say it's a small change in comparison to everything else that's going on but like one of the things that will be of major interest to Irish football fans is who will be managing the team going into next year and it's something that Eamon Sweeney is writing about in the Irish Independent this morning he's making the point that it's just time to bring Stephen Kenny in right now it's kind of like tough luck just let if there is a, a new football season from, say, August, September this year, just let Stephen Kenny be the manager, even if that requires going into the same European campaign. I, I wouldn't agree with that. Like, I think saying tough luck to anybody about anything right now isn't really the attitude that people need to have. Uh, Mick McCarthy has a job to do, which is to bring the sides to the European Championship final, and I think he should be given the chance to see that out. We're pressing pause on football at the moment. We can't just say that the football is stopping, but everything else will continue. Mm. So Mick McCarthy should 100% uh, 
be given the playoffs. And if it doesn't go right, well, Stephen Kenny will come in straight away. We, again, tomorrow, maybe we'll find out a bit more about when they intend to play these playoffs. But if Mick McCarthy qualifies and gets through against Slovakia and Bosnia or Northern Ireland, to take that away and say, well, actually, your contract's up, tough luck because of this once-in-a-generation situation we've found ourselves in, I, I would say, is, is totally unfair. And listen, I'm very much on the Stephen Kenny bandwagon and would love to see him in as soon as possible. But I think you've got to do the right thing. You can't say, let's do the right thing in all aspects of life and all aspects of society, except for the little bits we don't like and take a little shortcut here. The FAI are going to find themselves in that difficult situation. Stephen Kenny's contract says, I think, the 1st of August uh, 2020 is when he starts the job. But lots of people have contracts right now that are going to have to be renegotiated in every single walk mm -hmm. of life. And to suggest that if Ireland qualify, that Mick McCarthy wouldn't be the manager, I just don't think is is right or fair. And I don't know what Stephen Kenny's attitude. He's looking at this, I'm sure, thinking my contract is. But also, he very much lives in the real world. And we'll see what is happening. And is he going to try and step in and force the issue if the Republic of Ireland qualify? It's mixed team. This team, whether we like it or not, and quite often we don't like it, is Mick McCarthy's team. If he gets them to Euro 2021, as it'll probably be, he yeah. deserves to be the manager. I think I think Mick, you just ha you have to let Mick follow this thing through. This is the entire gr agreement. The agreement wasn't really based on a date; it was based on the end point of, of an entire process. And I think you've got to let mm. him finish it out. You got to let him see out the the playoffs at the very least. Uh, just a couple of other things to wrap up on. Then, like Jack Anderson writing in the Irish Examiner this morning about the immunity of the Olympics, that there still has been no budging whatsoever. The Prime Minister of Japan has come out uh, and said everything is fine. Everything will be going ahead. Which is astonishing, really, because there is still a lot of loose ends to be tied up when it comes to Olympic qualification, not least what is happening right now in London with an Olympic qualifier event. You've got the likes of Kurt Walker going out to fight for his place in the Olympics today. And it comes back to the point that you make about you know, like Wayne Rooney and guinea pigs and all that sort of thing. If footballers are being sent out there uh, to play against one another, boxers going into a boxing ring and, you know, we, we talk about the drop that's being exchanged by human beings in regular conversation mm. being detrimental to everybody's health. The drop that's being exchanged in a boxing ring, you can only imagine. It's, I, I just can't get my head around the fact that this is going ahead. Like, even in fairness to the Ireland boxing team, they cut tra short their own training camp in Italy because of this. Now, obviously, this is a, a continental pa and a global pandemic at this point. It's just beyond belief that this thing is happening. Like, you can't blame them for actually going forward and ensuring that their boxers are still in the competition because it is their one and only chance to qualify for the Olympic Games. But this is just this, this wide invincibility complex that the Olympics seems to have, which is ludicrous at this point. Well, it needs to be taken out of the sports people's hands. And it needs to be taken out of the sports administrator's hands. But the problem is that the British government have decided to go down a very different path mm. to our government and governments around the world. And we may all pay the price for that, it feels. We saw what happened at Cheltenham last week. We saw what happened at Anfield, the amount of people coming together. We don't know what the outcome of that is going to be. And the fear is that, obviously, the British government have hung their people out to dry but because we're such close neighbours that we're going to feel the ramifications of that as well. But there's so many parts of what's going on across the water that are just so strange. You're watching television, British television, and I was watching um, Question Time on Thursday night, and like, they spoke about the coronavirus for four or five questions, and like, there just didn't seem to be a full awareness of the gravity of the situation that there was here. You're, like flicked on Anton Deck's Saturday Night Takeaway, and there is a full audience of three or 400 people. Anton and Decker starting the show with a hand sanitizer joke. It, it just doesn't seem to have computed as to what is going on. And that obviously comes from, from the very top. And this attitude of, well, we're going to enjoy it while we can. And eventually when they press stop, then we'll take it seriously. And listen, maybe you do. Maybe that's what's happened in this country that ever since really Thursday morning when Leo Varadkar made that speech in Washington, the people have fully copped on to what's going on here and have taken it very, very seriously. But it's just the fact that we're only what, three, four days on from that, that Britain has such a different, different attitude. And it's, it's a terrible, horrible position for the boxers to be put in, especially considering I don't think anyone believes that the Olympics are going to take place uh, as, as they're meant to perhaps later in the year. Obviously, in Asia, thankfully, it feels as though maybe they're moving on to a slightly different stage of this outbreak and are starting to get some sort of containment. But how can you have an Olympic Games if this isn't contained in every single 
part of the world. If we aren't pretty much totally through this crisis, I don't think you can have an Olympic Games, and it certainly goes against the Olympic spirit, if you were to say, well, you know, we're mm. going to let in these 60 countries who have done things right and who have got on top of this pandemic, but the other countries, tough luck, you're not coming. I don't think that's that's feasible. And there's sponsors, there's money. Maybe there, there's probably many reasons why uh, the the Japanese feel they have to keep saying it's going to happen on, for as long as possible. But but deep down, they must know there's not a hope in hell it's going to happen. Well, like it's a good point that you make. If things are actually in a very different scenario over there than they are here, maybe the Japanese prime minister is the last person you need to be hearing from in this case because this is not a Japanese event. This is a global event. This is about the world. This is about where the epicenter of this pandemic is at the moment and athletes who are in grave danger at the moment really by going into a boxing ring for example uh, to puck the heads off one another rather than a situation where maybe the, the location is going to be safe come August. Like that is the important thing, it is the safety of the athlete where they are at at the moment as opposed to how Japan is fixed at the moment which as you say is getting a little bit better but we might come back to that before the end of the show. As you mentioned uh, a fairly terrible situation as well in the UK at the moment. We'll be chatting to Enda Stevens shortly as well uh, but next up we're chatting to Brian Farrell and Paul Ganey. Brian Farrell is a, a former Mead footballer of course, Paul Ganey current Kerry footballer. They are both publicans, they'll be talking to us about the recent decision to inform all pubs around Ireland uh, to close business for the foreseeable future. Before we get on to the lads, let's just play you this from Clean O'Connor on the Sunday paper review yesterday. She reflected on a surprisingly good debut column from Wayne Rooney in the Sunday Times. We don't have that. We'll come back to that in uh, just a moment. Um, it's, uh, we'll, go straight, we'll go straight to an ad break, actually, and we'll be back in a sec. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. OTB Sports yeah. Radio, football never stops and neither do we. Don't shoot, don't, don't, don't shoot. Oh, oh, he dinged it. Oh! The Football Show is the only place to get the best analysis. We've tried this way and we've been trying it for a long time. Just have to process them. No. Best interviews. They were talking that you used to go commando when you played, and uh... yeah, I did. Yeah, I never, never wore pants. Still don't wear pants. And best opinions and all things from across the pond and here in Ireland. Live every night from 9 p.m. on OTB Sports Radio. I listen all the time. Get OTB Sports Radio online at offtheball.com forward slash radio or on your phone by downloading the Go Loud app. The OTB Brief. Everything you need to know about sport every morning. Need to get on top of the day sports news? Well, the OTB Brief is the only sports update you'll need every morning. With all the breaking stories, post-match reaction. They had one more day to rest. We, we were really in trouble. Really in trouble to build the team. And the best bits from off the ball, all in a 10-minute podcast. Oh, sweat, sweaty palms. Uh, you, 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 uh, of course, you guys know what it's like, but... Uh... Uh, that was nerve. That was nerve, yeah. The OTB Brief, online every morning from 7am on offtheball.com, the Go Loud app, and everywhere you get your podcasts. OTB AM. It is four minutes past eight on this Monday morning. You're watching OTB AM. You can tweet us at Off The Ball if you've got any comments uh, or questions for us this morning. We're with you until half past nine. Right, we're turning our attention uh, to the publicans and, and those running pubs that have been affected by the coronavirus outbreak over the past couple of days. Uh, we've got two big GA names on the line. We've got former Meath footballer Brian Farrell on the line and also current Kerry footballer Paul Ganey on the line. Uh, good morning to you, lads. You're very welcome. Good morning. How are you going on? Uh, Brian, we might start with you. You might just uh, explain to us uh, the last few days for you personally and uh, for your business. Yeah, so um, I suppose the, the landscape has been changing by two or three times every day. Um, so kind of at the end of last week, we kind of knew we were under pressure kind of to stay open and that it was probably going to be only a matter of time. And you were kind of seeking some direction on it. Direction, to be honest with you, was slow. Um, coming from the government because they obviously have a lot more on their plate. Um, so the decision was kind of made Saturday evening that we had to kind of act on it and we made the decision Saturday night that when we closed the door that that was going to be it until until further notice in order to, I suppose, protect, protect our staff, protect our customers and just to do the right thing, you know. So your pub is a small rural pub and I take it uh, on a regular say weekday night and maybe even on a weekend night, there will be less than 100 people uh, in your pub. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. And and like I suppose when it was kind of a little bit jokey kind of in the middle of last week, the kind of the joke was that we put if, if we got over a hundred, we put the, the, the balance of the people out into the shed and they'd have to wait to come in. But I suppose that that never that never materialised, you know, we had to take everything so serious. So yeah, you would always be you would always be less than less than a hundred and to be pure kind of people within your your four or five mile radius that would that would be coming into you anyhow but e even with the number half of 100 like 100 was always going to be a strange number for a pub like yours to deal with because practicing say social distancing you'd need a fraction of that i would have assumed yeah but like what is it like what is so the social distancing is something that we've just heard in the last three or four days you know we've never really we've never really encountered that before and as a country Let's be let's be honest about it. We we don't do social distance, and it's all in or nothing, isn't it? Really. Mm. Um. So it it was always going it was always going to be a challenge, you know. But it's like, like if someone says, was it a hard decision? It's it's not because it's as I heard someone before saying it's 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 completely the right decision, you know. And um, it, it's it's kind of we we'll, we'll get by. Like you've got most publicans probably have got maybe three to four weeks if lucky out of kind of a cash flow but it's the it's the employees around the country you know and our employees that you that you'd really really fear for you know uh, i might just bring paul gainey in on that paul good morning to you um, morning. would you be on, on the same page as brian there that this is the right decision I, I presume there might have been a few stag parties and stuff like that filtering through dingle over the course of the weekend yeah it's um undoubtedly the right decision um I suppose I would echo uh, Brian's on it on, on just the, the lateness of it. Um, and I suppose a lot of people were still unaware of how severe the situation was. And it kind of became more clear as, as the weekend was going. Um, we had a lot of cancellations on the Friday and that. And uh, you could see that it was going to be a lot quieter. It would have been an extremely busy weekend for us otherwise. Um, but then, you know, you could see Friday night was, was quiet enough. And then uh, Saturday, you could see as the day was going on that policing that, uh, you know, the, the social distancing was going to be difficult. And um, while we didn't have anywhere near 100, you know, people, I suppose, as, as the night went on with, with, with drink on board, just were in their usual habit of, you know, chatting within, within a close enough distance and... Um, it was obvious that we were going to have to make a decision anyway, regardless of, of the government coming in um, to, to close the doors. But um, it's definitely the right decision. It's, it's, it is difficult for, especially the staff, as Brian said. Um, you know, there's not much light shed yet as, as to what they can do over the next while and what we can do to, to keep um, to keep them employed but uh, we're going to try and do um, maybe a, a delivery service this week we'll try that um, I just got a, the internet up and running there over the weekend to order online but uh, it'll be difficult difficult enough with the English sparse population and, and uh, you know, you're talking about a massive radius of, of people but um, you know there is an older population as well here and, and, and you feel for those people that are at home it usually will pop into the pub for their sandwich or their dinner um, and, and, and as far as takeaway options go, there aren't too many facilities down here in Dingle for um, you know wholesome meals or or, or you know your your roast of the day um, and that sort of thing. So we're going to try and uh, provide that for the people of the town. Um, it'd probably be more in our interest to, to close the door and just shut up shop. But uh, you know, I suppose these things have to be um, provided for as well in small communities. So. Um, I'm sure a lot of pubs, uh, little restaurants as well around the country will, will provide those sort of, um, you know, services for people over the next while. Yeah, for sure. I think there was uh, a lot of anger over the course of the weekend when uh, a particular video from Temple Bar in particular went viral mm -hmm. when you had like uh, close to 100 people, I don't know yeah. the exact number, singing Sweet Caroline in a pub. Like obviously you said yourself that you were open on Saturday night and that you were going to come to the decision to close this pub anyway, but I think that there was almost a, a rush to tar all pubs with the, the one brush as soon as those, yeah, that video came out. Yeah, thrown into the fire as a, as a whole, I think, and I think it was wrong because um, the pubs, I'm sure, were doing a lot, you know, that they thought they were doing the right thing, but there wasn't the total, um, the severity wasn't really made 100% clear. Like, you know, I, I think that's clear across anything. People standing in shops talking to each other is the same thing, and, you know, on the streets, and uh, it's just a, uh, um, as Ryan said, the, the people, we don't we, we don't we didn't know what social distancing was until you know a couple of days ago, and and, and that's the whole psyche of it. Um, and then I suppose 
Cubs were an easy target then because of uh, because of what went on on, on on social media and then the whole lot were tired of the same brush. Um, so, you know, that's difficult for the industry to take. Um, I'm sure there was many more pubs around the country that um, were completely fine and who would have been fine as well. But you just, I suppose you just can't take the chance anymore. Um, it, it's it's a, it's an emergency situation now and it's been made very clear over the weekend. But, um, you know, if that had come a little bit sooner, it might have been easier um, for people to make those decisions earlier and... and um, and be more proactive about it, but uh, I suppose it's unprecedented, and the government had enough on their plate as well until it was uh, it was made clear that these steps had to be taken. I suppose. Yeah, Brian, uh, people are rightly preoccupied at the moment with the health side of this and making sure that we get through this outbreak. And in two or three months, people will start to focus more on the economic side and the economic damage I think that everybody in this country is going to have to suffer over the next while. From a rural pub's point of view, what sort of help can the government give you over the next few weeks to ensure that when we get through this, the pubs are actually in a position to reopen? Yeah, I suppose decision-making and making hard decisions would would assist us greatly, you know, and it would it would assist every, every business and organisation in in this country um, and I was, you listened to the interview yesterday with Dr. Michael Ryan from the who from the World Health Organization he's like he's like if, if you get paralyzed if you get paralyzed by not making decisions you will fail and especially he's come, come across all these emergencies so we ha- if the government make decisions and let us know what to do give us direction I think it would be great personally I feel that a pause button needs to be pressed for about 90 days starting with the banks and give people give people their grace on their kind of loan repayments, mortgage repayments, um, and then we go back and we look at kind of our rates companies, um, talk to our suppliers. But there needs to be a ninety day pause there for everyone to survive and to get through this. You know, Brian, if if that does not happen, how under threat is your own business? How under threat are businesses in your locality? Well, I I I think they're they're severely under un, under pressure. Like you know, um. You're talking about they'll have to be backed up maybe from um, family members' personal savings, going to get in restructuring loans in the banks, which is just kicking the can down the road, really. But um, if if there's not an element of assistance, like I see, I see last night they come out and announced that they are looking for employers to pay the two hundred and three euro per employee that you lay off. But like employee employers won't have that cash flow, you know, that cash flow will run out after two weeks, you know, like you can't Diageo, like we've all our stock and Paul would be the same. They have all their stock that we were going to sell this weekend and into early this week. That still has to be paid for, even though there's no takings and that that stays in stock, you know. So it's um, if, if there's no action taken, it will lead to severe consequences. Yeah. Paul, what about in your situation then? Obviously, you've mentioned going out and potentially offering a delivery service. That's kind of a two-pronged approach. Obviously, the local people in the locality are getting that service. Uh, you've also got the element of your own staff actually having some employment. I presume it has to keep you taking over as a business as well. Yeah, absolutely. If, you know, you have to try whatever you can to keep your, your head above water. And uh, I suppose those two things as you mentioned are, are kind of two main uh, focuses for it is literally the employees to try and keep them um, in, in the job and, and to you know provide a service then as well for the people that need it most around the town um, and, and the surrounding areas but um, yeah look I suppose two weeks is what they're, they're putting on it but in all likelihood if you look at elsewhere if you look at China they're just after starting to receive numbers on Friday I think and that's two months in so Probably it's probably more you're looking at four four weeks or you know Italy's uh, still it's a, a week ahead of us and still in, in, in crisis there so that's you're talking three to four weeks at the very least so um, probably the quicker that, uh, that 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 is as well is made more clear to to businesses um, they can take more steps uh, mm. to, to 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 try and um, to try and sort themselves out but. Uh, you know, the cash flow is going to be under severe pressure in a lot of businesses. And uh, as, as we made clear, well, I think there's, been, there's a, a lot of pubs will close and will never open again throughout the country. Um, so, you know, individually, every business is going to have to try and do what they can. And uh, it's just going to be a very difficult time for the industry. Um, I know everyone in the country is going to be 
uh, affected by this. But uh, you know, if you if you have uh, if you have a government job or uh, or other jobs, you, you you still get paid. Um, it's just it's it's more the the, the industry, the, the tourist industry is going to take a severe hit, and um, you're talking about all the hotels uh, cancellations for the next six months as a result of it, and all those people that uh, were, were gearing up to to go into school season. Um, you know, we've taken on an extra couple of employees as well over the last while to, to gear up for the season, which usually kicks off around Patrick's Day. Um, so you, you'd have a lot of businesses in that situation um, with that investment put in for the coming season. And uh, I don't know what the government can do for for it. Um, something something will have to be done, I'm afraid. It's an unbelievably tough time, Paul. And it's almost the sort of time you would love to have football as something to take your mind off it, to go and kick a ball. Is that something you've been able to do at all? I know it doesn't seem important and it isn't important in the grand scheme of things, but has there been, are you keeping yourself fit? Are you going to be able to keep yourself ticking along over the next few weeks? Yeah, obviously over the last couple of days it's been pretty hectic um, trying to get her ducks in a row, but uh, yeah, I, I, I keep fitting over the next while and, and get up to the field and, and, and do some fitness work and some, some skills work, but uh, it's very difficult. It's going to be very difficult to the one doing all that on your own again. It's kind of it's like uh, almost going into the off season again, um, because you, you obviously you can't uh, you can't train you can't train with anyone or uh, you can't use gyms as such. You know, so it's going to be very hard. But um, yeah, we, we could be back in two weeks, so you have to be ready for that. Um, so that's, that's that's the main the main aim now over the next while is to keep the the fitness taking over and, and be ready for be ready for the season if it comes along again quickly. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's it's going to be a strange period. Obviously, it's the thing you want to do at the moment is take take the mind off uh, all that's going on is go out and play football. And unfortunately, we can't do that. And people are people that will be at home. We want to be putting on sports the weekend, and they don't have that either. So it's going to be a difficult time for everyone. But um, yeah, just get out and, and and make sure that you're keeping your your mind from being idle. I think is a is a is a strong message just been out there, and uh, it's important for people to do that, um, even if it is in isolation. Absolutely, Paul. Uh, final word to you then, Brian. I think you're manager of Red Hoth uh, at the moment. Obviously, the clubs at the moment not going to be allowed to train either. Rightly so. No collective training. Is is there going to be anything? Is the pitch going to be open for people to even train on their own? Is there any advice you'd have? Uh, to club footballers who are at a loose end at the moment? I suppose, like, the GA has come down and more or less kind of closed gyms and pitches, mm -hmm. you know, and they've kind of threatened uh, that you wouldn't be covered in insurance, basically. I, look, at I, I think they should be left open so that guys can go and do their own bit of work, you know. Uh, I think direction also should come whether can you train in twos and threes, you know, because... You know, we're talking social distancing or social isolation. You know, there's a big difference, you know, and it's far, as Paul said there, it's far the mind and the body now. And that date that's thrown out there, the 29th of March, you know, it's like that's many days away now. It's only 13 days away. So it's that's kind of pie in the sky. We're probably looking four weeks. So, look, I'd love to be able to tell lads to go out in groups of twos and threes and do their own bit and take ownership for their own body and their own mentality and do your bits of programmes. But... I don't know if we're going to be allowed. It could be mm. guys just having to get out and do bits and pieces on their own. Yeah, and I guess home fitness regimes and things like that are going to be all the rage over the next couple of weeks as well. Uh, listen, Brian, thanks for taking the call. Really appreciate it. Uh, and Paul Ganey as well. Very best luck to you over the next couple of weeks. It's going to be a tough time, but we wish you uh, all the best. Um, Brian Farrell, former Mead footballer, and Paul Ganey, current Kerry footballer on the line there. Uh, Nathan is still with us. Nathan, it's obviously... Uh, an unbelievably tough time for anybody in that sort of situation and just trying to find and come up with any sort of creative way to even lessen the blow some bit mm. is clearly paramount and you can hear what Paul Ganey is talking about there, just trying to get a delivery service going or anything along those lines. Well, that's like, there's never been a, a situation where there's been so many layers to a crisis and like the social isolation is going to be a huge mental health issue for so many people, particularly down in rural parts of the country, like I'm up here, you know, stressing about having three children yeah. and having them locked in. There's so many people who, have, you know, know lots of myself who, you know, are stuck in a house by themselves for an unspecified amount of time. And anything like what Paul is talking about is say, it's probably not going to be a real money earner for him, but having somebody and something for somebody to look forward to that 
a bit of food will be dropped at the door is the sort of thing that at least keeps people's spirits up because I think for people, particularly in rural areas and real rural areas like West Kerry, uh, it's going to be a real, real struggle over the next while. Yeah, absolutely. We are crossing over to the UK next because Enda Stevens is on standby. But before that, let's go back to yesterday's Sunday paper review because Clino O'Connor reflected on this column from Wayne Rooney. I just thought Rooney was a street footballer. 16 years old, played without a conscious thought, uh, reactive. And actually, from the age when he played for the Everton under 19s, when he was 14, obviously, which is just uh, nuts. But he obviously he couldn't boss people around physically, so his coach put him at number 10, told him to get into space. And Rooney, as a 14 year old, went off and got VHS videos of Yari Littmanen and to a lesser extent, Dennis Burkamp, and studied them. So, uh, like a student of the game at 14, and hence, when Alex, uh, Oxley Chamberlain doesn't know uh, how Overmars played and came short and spun around to you know get in behind, he's he's kind of in amazement at this really. So I don't know what you made of this, but I, I would agree with Tommy. Uh, this was actually surprisingly good. Yeah, it, it was, and it, that again, one of the things that stood out to me. Um, well, well, that's the differentiator, isn't it? Because there's there's probably loads and loads of street footballers who had really good talent and really good ability and all of that. But how many of them went and got their VHSs and absolutely devoured the game and made themselves exceptionally knowledgeable and intelligent on a football pitch? So Rooney had physical um, or technical skills um, and he was good enough at 14, as you were saying, to play for an under-19. So he, his technical skills were good enough, but he didn't um, rely on them he made sure that he understood exactly what he was doing. And that, I mean, that as an attribute for any athlete in any sport, that's what you want. People talk about the growth mindset and, and never having enough knowledge and wanting to know more and wanting to be intelligent in your sport. That is an absolute differentiator between the child superstar that makes it and the child superstar that, oh, I had one trial for United and it didn't work out. Um, you know, they sure they didn't give me any game time or whatever. You know, and they, there's an excuse and it didn't happen. Um, so in terms of characteristics of a set, successful athlete, I mean, that's a major one. Yeah, Keen O'Connor on yesterday's Sunday paper review. You can get the full piece back on youtube.com forward slash off the ball and available on your favourite podcast app right now as well. Right, going to the UK because Sheffield United's Enda Stevens is with us on the line. Good morning to you, Enda. How are things? I'm good, mate. You? Not too bad, thanks. Uh, so, what is the state of play there at the moment? Is there, is there training to, this morning as a Sheffield United footballer, or what, how are you getting on? Um, no, this morning we've had we had a a meeting on Friday, obviously when everything was announced, and then we had the Saturday, Sunday, and today off. Um, but well, I think we're back in training Tuesday. I think the academy and all that have been sent home, and it's literally just the uh, first team lads, players, and staff that are allowed in the building. So. Um, I think we're going to try to treat as normal as normal as we can for the week with training and that. It, it, I presume that's just because of the fact that you're very much operating under the premise that football will be back at the start of April because that is what they have said at the moment. Yeah, we've got a we've got to aim for that. We've got a plan for that. So um, we don't want to we don't want to have week uh, a week two weeks off and then all of a sudden it comes like on and we won't be prepared. So the manager kind of wants to keep us prepared and. He's done all the health checks. I think they've disinfected the whole building and that. We're trying to do our best to, kind of to, to be isolated in the training ground as much as you can. What was said in the meeting on Friday? Was the calm? Was the mood very calm? Was it composed? Was it a sense that things would be all right and we will be back out in the football pitch soon? Yeah, I think so, because it was more, more kind of early days. But, it, um, but over the weekend, you kind of see the news breaking of more and more cases and that. And it, it's a bit surreal, but um, we, we still have to kind of plan for that. That that the league kicking back in, in April. If it does, um, we want to be prepared, and if it doesn't, I, I, we, we really don't really know what to be thinking. Mm, absolutely, I like. I, I can completely see why you would need to be keeping on top of things, keeping on top of training, because that is the message that has been handed down. At the same time, is there any doubts in your mind at all because of the fact that other teams within Sheffield United Football Club have been told to stay at home, have been told to go home, and that you're the only lads actually going to be in the training ground? Um, yeah, yeah it's a bit, it is a bit... It's a, I don't know, it's hard to kind of believe all, mm. all the stuff that's actually happening. Um, we haven't actually been in the training ground yet, so I think from down the line... Um, especially coming up to the weekends, we'll be thinking like, "This is a bit crazy." Um, I don't know. Like, it, 
we just need to take every every precaution. Um, and as a club, they've kind of made that decision to just kind of disinfect the whole building, send as many people home as they can, and then just keep it a tight little community in the in the in the training ground. Would you usually be training on a Monday morning? Is it already a precaution to actually push it back to tomorrow? Uh, sorry, could you say that again? Would you usually be training right now? Is it already a precautionary step to not have training on a Monday morning? Um, I, I don't know. To be honest with you, we were we were due to train this morning. Okay, um, right. And we just received a, we we just received a text yesterday to say we. We'll, I think they just train, changed the schedule around. I think we'll go instead of having Wednesday off, Wednesday off. I think we'll just go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, training. So I just think they changed the the schedule around rather than being a precautionary like. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, it probably helps as well to just have an extra day to see if there is any movement because I think if you compare the situations, and I'm sure you've been communicating quite a bit with people at home, and uh, it is a vastly different situation in the UK and how the UK government are handling it compared to the Irish government. And like as we've already established here, Sheffield United have to operate under what they are being told, but it is different to what people are being told here when it comes to even GA clubs and football clubs to not train collectively, to stay at home. And that is a different message that you guys are being given in the United Kingdom. Yeah, I think, well, from what I know, I think the League of Ireland is completely shut down. Mm. Um, I was speaking to my friend at Bowles and he's been given like his GPS units and that to do his own training um, and to stay fit. But I, um, I don't know, like it's just, <laughs> I'm not really, I'm not really want to look to delve into it. Um, I just gotta go by what my manager thinks and what the club think, and um, they uh, we've we've got our doctors on hand, and he seems to think we'll be fit and able to contain it um, within ourselves, within the tra- within the training ground, and, and we've got to we've got to believe in that and, and back them. Uh, outside of Sheffield United, then what is the mood like in the United Kingdom? Um, I don't really know. I've been kind of. I've been kind of just self isolating myself, me and my girlfriend, my little baby. So we haven't really been going out outdoors, really meeting people or meeting up with lads or anything like that. Um, I think the first time I'll see people uh, from the team and really outside will be tomorrow in training. Yeah, so th- there hasn't been too much socialising socialising outside of your your house or anything like that. Is, is there any concern at all about? What's happening in the likes of Chelsea with a couple with Callum Hudson Odoi obviously testing positive, Mikel Arteta at Arsenal testing positive. That this isn't something that footballers are going to be immune from. And like you mentioned, in your family and things like that. This is something that if you go into a collective training session and somebody is carrying the virus without knowing it, there are obviously wider implications for that and, and serious dangers for that. Yeah, I think I think if anyone is to show symptoms, they're not to show up. Um, we've had that meeting on Friday. Um, so if there was anyone with the symptoms, or they just got to speak to the doctor, and the doctor will say stay away um, for the for the necessary time and that. But um, I think I think a few lads have have been tested, um, and we haven't really seemed to have that kind of one which has had the coronavirus just yet. Mm. Uh, would you be able to, to keep yourself ticking along nicely at home if you were told to stay away from the training ground over the next few weeks? Is there a good home fitness regime that you have? Um, well, it's difficult for me because I'm kind of nursing a bit of an injury at the mm. minute, so I kind of need to be in, in the training ground, like get me rehab and 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 being with the physio. So um, that's where it kind of it kind of comes a bit difficult. But uh, I'm pretty sure plenty of lads will be. I think plenty of lads today with the day off will probably be out having a, going for a run themselves. But they they struggle to go to public gyms because they, they're probably. One of the worst places where you can probably con- uh, con- uh, get the virus and swim pills and that. So uh, it's a difficult one, but it's one that me personally I prefer to be in the training ground, um, training and that, um, if that is possible. If it's if it puts us at less risk in any way possible, I'd, lo- I'd rather be in the training ground. And uh, this has obviously uh, escalated rapidly over the past few days, but we actually had your manager Chris Wilder on the show. On Thursday, and at that stage, I was asking him about whether or not he would prefer to see games played behind closed doors, or whether he'd just prefer to have the season postponed. And at that stage, he was talking about having the season postponed. That like football is all about the supporters. With the situation we're in now, and I don't think anybody expects supporters to be able to return. Would you be happy to play games behind 
closed doors. One of the options that's been put out is maybe the season will be just voided completely and everyone goes back next August to 22 team league. Have you have any opinion on what should happen next? It's well, I'm not too sure that the one you don't want to you don't want to be playing games for any closed doors because you wouldn't miss that fine interaction and that. And obviously everyone understands that the risks that come with it. Um, but in terms of like avoiding the league, I think you kind of have to get to that stage. Let's see how the the next three four weeks is going to be. Let's see what comes of, comes of it. But um, I don't know. It's, it's a hard decision to make because it's 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 surreal for us. You know, we are just used to training during the week, and then we look forward to our games, and we have nothing to look forward to at the minute. Like a lot of people, um, so I think we just got to kind of let it get to that. And, and just see see how we get on. Yeah, there the is also probably, I'd assume, the mental health aspect of it as well and uh, having the routine of going into training and then also the fitness uh, that comes with it. I know obviously you're carrying a knock at the moment, but that being taken out of your life at the moment, that will provide its own sort of mental challenges over these next few weeks, I'm sure. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be tough. It'd be a bit stressful, you know, because you'd be kind of stuck at home and you're used to getting out and getting um, just being in an environment with a lot of good lads and good friends and that and you, you, you kind of need that um, the worst thing that could probably come of it is that you have to self isolate for a long time and um, maybe it'd be a bit torture like you know um, but if it as I said if it needs to be done it needs to be done um, obviously this is going to get a lot worse before it gets better and we've got to kind of do our best to contain it it's obviously uh more than likely at this point. I think it would be an absolute shock if uh, the playoff against Slovakia were to go ahead anytime soon. Uh, it's going to be a situation where it gets kicked down the line quite a bit. Who knows when that game uh, is going to be played. Uh, in terms of that, is it something you've considered at all, that this opportunity to play in the Euros this summer uh, is now going to have to be kicked back a little bit? Or are you just focused on, on Sheffield United at the moment? Um, I haven't really been doing much thinking about that because obviously... Everything's just come at once, you know. Just trying to get your head around the Premier League being cancelled, and obviously we've been fighting for like European places and that, and everything's just been put on hold. And it's um, it's all just kind of hit you, hit you at once, and it's hard to kind of hasn't really, well, it's sunk in, but it's, I think over the next week and two two weeks it'll really sink in. And I don't know, it's just it's the not known is kind of what's killing us. Um, I think it's killing everybody. We kind of just need want to know what. Uh, what's the best thing to do, and and how quick can we can we get over this? Has there been word from the Republic of Ireland management at all, just to sort of similar to Sheffield United, stay on your toes in case this thing does go ahead, as unbelievably unlikely as that is at the moment? Um, no, not really, because I, I don't think I think they kind of I don't think they expect it to be going ahead. Yeah. Um, we just had our meetings with Sheffield. We've we've had a couple of briefings even before. Before Friday, we we've had briefings throughout the weeks and just like obviously washing your hands and, and, and keeping as clean as you can, and um, that's all we kind of have. Has I think we we probably be expected to have a lot more meetings now over the next week and be filled in a lot more. I don't know. I think there might be a meeting going on with the Premier League to discuss things, and and, and we'll have to go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, Enda, it's been great chatting to you. Thanks, Billy, for taking the call, uh, and stay safe over there. We wish you all the best. Cheers, thanks. And the Stevens there, Sheffield United, full back on the line. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one, Nathan. You can't really blame Sheffield United for continuing to proceed with things. It is the powers above them, obviously, where the questions need to be asked at the moment. And the powers at the very, very top of life in the United Kingdom, where serious questions have to be asked, that people are still in a will we, won't we? Will we go into collective training? Won't we go into collective training? Because that mere idea at the moment seems absurd. Well, I think everybody is obviously putting their trust in the government that they are doing the right thing. And like Sheffield United, I would say, are no different to pretty much every uh, Premier League club. Though I did see, I think, Liverpool sent home all their players at the end of last week with personalised training regimes, that there wouldn't be any collective training uh, for the foreseeable future. Different clubs obviously have different attitudes, but they aren't doing anything technically wrong, according to mm. the British government, who are saying and don't seem to have a big problem with even mass gathering still. I know that's going to change uh, quite quickly, it seems, this week. But as I say, all you need to do is switch on your television and you will see many, many people together in television studios and just a, a, a totally different attitude uh, that listen, may well have 
far-reaching consequences for British society and may well have consequences for us here in Ireland as well. Uh, it, it, I think as footballers, all they're ever going to do as professionals is pretty much do what they're told and trust the advice that they've been given by their club doctors. Yeah, that's the only thing they really can do at the moment. Like It's interesting this team that is constantly going to come up and I'd say it's going to be more pronounced almost for professional footballers over these next few months is what do we do now? Like, as you say, they're so used to being told what to do, and that is still the case. They are still assuming that they will go into collective training in some manner or form mm. as a Premier League footballer, and then that'll be perhaps taken away from them, and maybe what if the season is called off and you're in a bit of a limbo about when does the next season actually begin? Like, th these are all the challenges that will come into play for professional, professional athletes over these next few months. Obviously, there are people in far graver situations, people who will lose livelihoods and things like that, but these are still issues as well that professionals will face. Well, I wonder actually are professional footballers in a far better position to deal with a crisis like this? Because I remember an article Stephen Hunt wrote uh, a few years ago, which I think he got quite a bit of stick at from the GEA players at the time, where he spoke about what it was like to be a professional footballer. And GEA players, in a way, didn't know how good they had it because part of being a professional is doing nothing. That part of being a professional footballer is getting home from training at one o'clock and doing nothing for the next seven or eight hours of resting your body, of lying on the couch, of... Of even at times he said, you know, if he was coming up to a big match, of not getting off the couch to go and pick the kids up from school or do the run to the shops because his entire focus was on having his body in the best possible shape at all times. So there is a lot of time spent at home just resting the body and resting the mind. And I suspect they're a little bit more used to that side of things than the rest of us are who probably have slightly more hectic lives. Obviously, they have that intense training session that gets them to another level of fitness that the rest of us are never going to have, that they are going to miss and that they're going to have to try and maintain. But I think the actual spending time by yourself and for probably the younger players, you know, spending a lot of time on PlayStation is something they're probably well used to at this stage. Yeah, it's a good point, actually. It's something like that we've seen quite a bit, that professional footballers tend to have the ability or they have the ability to pick up, say, the bug of gaming quite a bit. It's something actually that I'd be interested to hear David Myler's thoughts on actually that, that even during the tail end of his professional career to have this other interest just completely explode off the pitch while he was going to training in the middle of the day just because you've got so much free time that we could probably learn a thing or two from them about how they actually deal with that, how they kind of park that cabin fever early on because I'm sure it is a challenge for people who go into a professional environment at say a later age than the academy setups because they've got to use, get used to all of this sort of thing. Well, it, most footballers, I imagine, go for a nice little nap every mm. afternoon as well, which is the right thing to do and <laughs> the recommended thing to do. We'd all love to uh, do that now for the next few weeks and get our mind off things. So I do think, yeah, it, it, it's the players and like everybody who doesn't have an interest that somehow you can maintain over the next while that it's it's going to be a bit of a struggle. And if you're into gaming, and I was semi-joking about getting a PlayStation, yeah. semi-joking, I, I, I used to be a... a football manager addict like I'm sure many mm. of our viewers have been down through the years and uh, at various stages uh, particularly when I first met my wife I uh, got her to break my football manager CD as it was at the time right just to stop me from playing it uh, because I was like it was just insane listen anybody who plays football manager knows how addictive it is but part of me actually thinks maybe the best thing for my mental health right now is to get back into football manager no. because you can get so into it <laughs> you can get so into it that actually it just takes your mind off absolutely everything else. Suddenly, I'm not stressing and worrying about the real world. I'm wondering, is Cherno Samba going to be fit? Mm. And whether, to see, you see, of course, obviously you're only going to play a championship manager or 102. You, I, the new one, from what I've seen, is just far, far too complicated. Like, you have to do training sessions. No, I want to pick Julius Agahoa, Cherno Samba up front, 17 and 19, and let them bloom over the next decade. And suddenly, if I'm stressing about that, I'm not stressing about the real world. And maybe that's a good thing. So what was it? This was some sort of ceremony where you were like, listen, I'm now going to dedicate my life to something other than football manager. You can come yes. and smash this CD. <laughs> uh, yes. And then uh, I think I, I decided about a month later, I'll get it again. I'll be more restrained. <laughs> but uh, I didn't have that uh, power, unfortunately, to do that. So again, uh, the... Uh, the disc went in the bin. But I'm fairly sure you can download Championship Manager 0102 just straight onto your laptop now. Really? I thought you could only do that for new. Oh, no. See, this is the thing. Yes. I've never, I never did get onto the Championship Manager buzz that oh. early. That early. Like, I'm very much about 2012, I think, was probably my peak football manager. So I didn't actually get onto the Cherno Samba, Freddie Adu sort of glory years that everybody raves about. But you'd obviously, oh. you'd obviously recommend it. 
Oh, absolutely. Like you go in and whatever club you're managing, I think Turn of Samba plays for Millwall when he's still 16. And you go in day one, you sign him, you're probably going to have to pay a good chunk of money. And the frustration with him is, you know, he doesn't, he, while he's unbelievably talented for a 16 year old, as all 16 year olds are, you know, they're frustrating and inconsistent. So you do have to wait two or three years. And the worry is that you get fired from your current club that you've bought him for. And then he's stuck there, you're gone, and he goes on to become the greatest player in the world. And you're stuck managing Leicester City, who back in Championship Manager 0102 is not a good place to be. Just got a, a, a YouTube comment in here from Christian Pierce saying Championship Manager 102 is free to play. Exactly. So, yeah, so uh, all, you, all you need to do now is download it. So there you go. Community made transfer updates also. So transfer updates, does that mean to the end of the season? Or that they have the current, does that mean they have the current players? That would be sensational if that was the case because that's what you want. You want a sort of dumbed down version of it that you can actually get in, play a decade of football manager in the space of a month. Mm. Whereas in the current guys doing a season of football manager in a month would be a big thing. But I think they've actually got in the, the new one. I may have actually done a bit of research on this over the course of the weekend. Apparently, the new football manager, they have started to scale it back a bit because okay. they have realized that this is just outrageous. Like, this is a, the level of detail you can possibly have. We, we never got into yet your opening comment about that you had downloaded Fortnite. Yeah. But is Fortnite not for children? I'm a child, Nathan. Fortnite is, Fortnite is for everybody, really. There you can't, no person, no person too young, too old can play. I think it's just the same as uh, any other athletic endeavor, Nathan. The older you get, the slower you get, and the slower your reaction times are get. That's why kids are better at it than adults. But I still fancy myself as a bit of a trigger finger and uh, could uh, possibly thrive in a Fortnite environment. But I didn't. I didn't do it. I like I got fifteen percent and then clicked cancel on that because. Um, good, good. It, that that would be automatic self isolation. You wouldn't even need to self isolate yourself if you were playing um, Fortnite at my age. But well, football manager is a far more mature choice. I think it's fair to say. I think I think so too. We must look into that championship manager or one or two free to play. Mm. Uh, make sure to comment on the YouTube stream below if you've got any more championship manager uh, updates for Nathan and I, or you can tweet us as well at off the ball. Right, we're going to have the sports news with Tom very shortly. But before that, during yesterday's Sunday pay-per-view, the realities of working from home dawned on one Tommy Martin. Lingering memories, probably far more so than Liverpool, Atletico, the, the scenes at Cheltenham last mm. week. Now, who knows? The months ahead, I'm sure, will uh, provide us with uh, far more uh, vivid memories, unfortunately. But it was a really bad week for that sport in particular. Tom? Yeah, yeah. Just like that, just of an intrusion here. Um, yeah, it's, um, I can see you. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, if, if Tommy Martin's wife is listening to the radio, could she rescue Tommy? Uh, his daughter has made an appearance to the nation. Thank you. Oh, dear. Um, I, saw, I saw a tweet, Tommy, you know, remember when uh, we first started doing Skype in the world on media and the BBC News guy and his daughter walks in. I saw during the week someone had yeah. uh, retweeted that picture and said, this is all of us now. And Tommy yeah. Martin, this is you. <laughs> exactly. exactly. In fairness, my wife, she did bring them uh, away for a walk for an hour. How long does it take to review the papers? We're home, for God's sake. God, get on with it. Yeah, now is your time, children of Ireland, if uh, your parents happen to be sports broadcasters that are on off the ball. Now is the time to make your name, your time to shine. Tom Malone, good morning. What's the crack? Hi, Owen. How are you? I'm hoping Shane Hannan or Amory Donlan don't do the same and ruin my live news broadcast <laughs> here in the office. Children just can't be trusted. We are practicing very sensible social distancing. You are about 20 metres away. But we're in the same about office. 20. You can't yeah, be bothered in coming office. into the studio, basically, is what the story is, Tom. Yeah, essentially. Tommy's laid down the very sensible rules, so we're all going to obey them. How has uh, isolation been for you? Um, it's been pretty strange. Uh, I'm, obviously, I'm, we're, I'm in the office today on my own. Pretty much this bulletin echoing Distancing, sorry. Place, distancing, so not, not isolation, just to be clear. Pardon? This distancing is what I meant to say, not isolation. You don't need to isolate just yet. No, thankfully, I don't. No, no, no. But no, the, the social distancing is going, uh, okay, okay. It's, it, look, it suits me anyway. It suits my personality. I don't really like people. Yeah, you hate people. You've, you've always made that clear, Tom. <laughs> you're, uh, you're a dick. Yeah, Everybody exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right, will we start with uh, a little bit of good news? Yeah, let's do it. 
Right. Uh, Manchester United's Paul Pogba has planned some financial support to help the coronavirus pandemic. The France midfielder has set up a fundraising page on Facebook and says he will double the amount raised if the £27,000 target is reached. Well, that's kind of where the good news ends, unfortunately. Uh, former Manchester City defender Elakim Mangala, meanwhile, is one of five Valencia players and staff to test positive for COVID-19. Argentina international Ezekiel Gary is another. Mangala has said, though, that he is self-isolating and the club say all of the individuals are in good health currently. We move on to boxing and Emmett Brennan will face a Swiss opponent in the last 16 of the Olympic qualifiers in London. The Dublin Docklands boxing clubman needs a top six finish to qualify for Tokyo. He's back in action tomorrow at St. Patrick's Day against Switzerland's Uke Smalley, who was joined in the last 16 by Tala Lightweight, George Bates and Dublin heavyweight Kirill Afanasival. Today in London, Aidan Walsh and Michael Nevin are fighting for places in the last 16 with all bouts behind closed doors from now on. Brendan Irvine, Carly McNall and Kurt Walker are vying for places in the last eight of qualifying. I was sick of boxing and it's been widely reported that the British boxing world champion Tyson Fury could face a new investigation from UK anti-doping. A failed drugs test in 2015 was blamed on eating uncastrated wild boar but a mail on Sunday has reported that allegations from a farmer who claimed he was offered money to provide a false alibi for Fury. He never received the money, though. Uh, however, promoter Frank Lauren, who wasn't involved with the boxer at the time, has dismissed that story as rubbish. Uh, full impact on the, corona the coronavirus is having on sport could be clearer by the end of the week, with five months to go until Tokyo 2020 and several qualifying events postponed. The International Olympic Committee will hold talks with the head of global go sport governing bodies tomorrow. Uh, there will also be a UEFA video conference where the postponement of Euro 2020 and how to reschedule the Champions League and Europa League will be on the agenda. Meetings of the British domestic leagues will follow later on the week to discuss the longer term plan. Of course, competitions there are currently shut down. Today, Rugby Union's Premiership and also the Super League, Rugby League Super League, are expected to be the next sports postponed. Uh, while a meeting is set to take place today is the best way forward on how the Six Nations, of course, that's already postponed. That's been uh, Halloween mooted there. Uh, horse racing in the UK looks like it's finally going to move behind closed doors this week. Uh, only Kelso will do so today. That's voluntarily while Hereford and Sutherland is racing there, but they will actually continue as normal. Bizarrely, course racing in Ireland has been behind closed doors since Friday morning on. Good stuff, Tom. Uh, that's incredible, really, that racing goes ahead at some parts of the UK yet again today. Uh, right, just before we wrap up the sports news today, have a look at this. This is a message from Jack McCaffrey, who is urging communities around Ireland to do their bit. Hi, guys. Jack McCaffrey here, just doing a very quick video. Um, still getting used to seeing my own clean shaven face uh, it's the first time in a long time I've been like that um, and the reason for that is because it helps those of us who work in hospitals protect ourselves and protect other patients while we're dealing with people who have um, the new COVID-19 disease and the reason for this video is that I'm just looking to uh, ask that everybody else continue to do their bit to help out with that as well um, whether that be washing our hands coming in and out of the house whether that be avoiding public gatherings um, I just want to thank everybody who's been helping so far and re-emphasize how important they are. So please, please, please do continue to follow those instructions and thank you very much. Yeah, great stuff from Jack McCaffrey there. Sending out a fairly worthwhile message. Uh, we're going to get to Classic Game Club soon. This morning, it's going to be the 1990 All-Ireland Football Final between Meath and Cork. A fantastic year for Cork GEA doing their first double in 100 years that year. So they did it in 1890, they did it in 1990 as well, winning the hurling and the football. It's going to be Tommy and Nathan with me. They've been watching the game back over the course of the weekend. Uh, but of secondary importance, uh, as well as at hand at the moment, and before we get into Classic Game Club, uh, Brian O'Driscoll reflected on the integral role sport plays in our lives. It, it, it always seems a little bit weird when events of such global magnitude are happening to be talking about sport. And at the same time, you know, in a couple of weeks' time, when when the full absence of sport from our lives begins to have an impact, we will begin to realise just how much we miss it and how important it is as something that is a social a social glue, and also just a way for us to to talk about things and to be distracted from the news cycle. One hundred percent, and and we take it for granted. We just you, you and you look at the amount of sport. 
that's being cancelled. Well, we're not even aware of how many events and how much is is going on, be it at a professional level, be it at an amateur level. You know, when you look at, you know, kids underage being cancelled, training sessions being cancelled, sport is an integral part of our existence, certainly in Ireland and, and part of my existence, you know, Saturday morning going down to, you know, my kids' football and gymnastics. All of those parts are just the makeup of your week and they're they're a staple and it's um, it's something that you look forward to and only when it's taken away from you do you realize what an important component it is to your existence so yeah I you know from our perspective and from everybody's perspective I hope this process doesn't go on longer than we anticipate it might because it it really is um it's a a key component plugged into people's everyday or uh, weekly living where they get refuge from work or from family or from whatever issues they might have and they're able to vent through their sporting team through playing themselves through going to the gym and it's it's such a, a vital part of society so um yeah it's 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 tricky and strange and weird times OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Off the ball. Oh, wow. This is... <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm washed off the ball. I'm Scottish. I'm oh, super oh, new. Oh, 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 oh. He met a South African last night and he was there. He knew that Dublin won five oh. in a row because he watched his off the ball. Oh. He really... And he listened no, to I, Thailand. I, I've watched off the ball on YouTube. The good boys. <laughs> We love you, we love you, and everywhere we follow, we follow, we follow. We absolutely love it. Off the ball. This is OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. OTB AM. And a 13 metres penalty for about the fourth time in this match. This is it then for me. This is it for Cork as well, however. Slocum, outside towards John O'Driscoll. It's going to be a free. Time will miss that. They live on the edge of their seats. Cork, beaten by Meade in 1967. Beaten by Meade in 1987. Beaten after a replay in 1988. Are the 14 men to prevail in front of their loyal band of fans. The subs wait. The double has been achieved. Yeah, the year, of course, is 1990, and those are the sounds from the All-Ireland football final between Meath and Cork. Cork doing the double. They, of course, had won the hurling a few weeks previous. It is our focus this morning for the Classic Game Club. This is the show where we go back and watch old matches. It's like a book club, except for classic games. This week, Tommy Rooney and Nathan Murphy have been watching back that classic between Meath and Cork. Uh, Nathan, as the resident spokesperson for the 1990s year, to put it that way. Do you remember this game at all? <laughs> uh, no, I was thinking you two lads, I presume, weren't even born No, uh, when this happened. Uh, no, and uh, watching it back last night, it's it's like watching a different sport. Part of me was watching it going, this is the worst game of Gaelic football <laughs> I have ever seen. And then I'm just trying to recalibrate my head that actually it just doesn't feel like the Gaelic football that we watch now in any way. Mm. Like... Like the brilliance of it is the toughness of it and obviously the rivalry of uh, Cork and Meath and Cork going for that first ever double and the sheer strength of some of the men on the pitch. But it, it's like, I don't remember once during the game a halfback getting the ball and making a rampaging run forward. Every time a halfback got the ball, it was, I'm going <laughs> to kick this as far forward as I possibly can. Like This is a final that took place, what, two months after Italia 90? Yeah. And it's Jack Charlton style football <laughs> is get it forward as quickly as you possibly can. Paul McGrath and Mick McCarthy on the pitch, of course, for Cork as well. The, the Italian <laughs> 90s references can go on and on. I noticed that as well. It's just, there's a lot of hoofing going on in this game. It is 
the most manly man's game potentially in the history of Gaelic football. I, I think it's probably peak manliness, peak tough guy. The, the a couple of things that I noticed, first of all, everybody in this game looks like they are 38 years old. They all look really unbelievably old. There is um, uh, a time when the camera pans to Stephen O'Brien and I'm like, uh, this guy is clearly a grizzled veteran. He clearly has about 10 kids. And then the commentator is like, Stephen O'Brien, of course, under 21 next year again. And I'm like, how, does all, how do all these kids look like they're 40 <laughs> years old? They all look like they've been through the wars. They've seen some things that none of us should see. They're, they're all well beyond their years. Everybody is a tough guy. And you do not want to get caught in the crossfire of Meade versus Cork in 1990. That's what living through the 80s does to you, I guess. It's true. Tough time. Like there's, there's many, uh, part, like Connor Cunahan's hair is a revelation mm. uh, throughout the game. Yeah, they they do all like the very fact Mick Lines is on the pitch just gives it an extra a level of manliness. Oh, without question, we'll get, we'll get into Mick Lines in a moment because he takes a haymaker and just brushes it off as if it's nothing. Just to give uh, the context uh, for this game, like as you mentioned there, and it was mentioned in the commentary there as well, a more than familiar rivalry at this point, late 80s into the early 90s, Meath versus Cork. So they'd met in the 1987 final, Meath had won that game. Met in the 1988 final, Meath had won that game. At this point, Cork had never actually beaten Meath in the All-Ireland Football Championship, but they had beaten Mayo to win the 1989 All-Ireland Final. So they're going for a double-double of sorts, because as we've mentioned, they've beaten Galway in the hurling a few weeks previous and were All-Ireland football champions. And to make it sweeter, they now have a crack at Meath to get revenge for 87 and 88 in the 1990 decider. So this is 100 years on since their only other double. So there's a kind of a nice symmetry to that 80-90, the last time they did it. I was looking into this as to whether or not Cork are the only county to ever do the double, they're not. Can you guess, Nathan, the other county to have done it? I'm going to say Tipperary. Oh, great shout. Yeah, correct. Got it in one. Tipperary, your uh, 19th century GA knowledge knows no bounds. Ah, just don't ask me to name the year. <laughs> 1923. <laughs> I think it's something around then. I uh, didn't even jot that down here. Uh, just to go through uh, the teams in the day and... Just to clarify, each and every one of these is a hard bastard, I think it's fair to say. So the Cork team, you John Kerrans in goal, you have a, a full back line of Tony Nation, Niall Cahalan, the beast that is Niall Cahalan, uh, and Stephen O'Brien as a full back line. Michael Slocum, Connor Cunahan, and Barry Coffey as their half backs, while Shea Fahey and Danny Cullity, like a hard hitting midfield there, uh, they're eight and nine for Cork on the day. Dave Barry, Captain Larry Tompkins, and Teddy McCarthy is the half forward line. Teddy McCarthy, of course, the only man to have started the hurling who's also involved in this football team. Paul McGrath and Mick McCarthy, as I've already mentioned, either side of Colm O'Neill in the full forward line. Mead then, their goalkeeper was Donald Smith. They have a full back line of Robbie O'Malley, Mick Lyons, and Terry Ferguson. A half back line of Brendan Riley, Kevin Foley, and Martin O'Connell. Liam Hayes and Jerry McEntee in midfield. Like that is. That is the battle to end all battles. Shea Fahey and Danny Cullity against Liam Hayes and Jerry McEntee. Fantastic uh, lineup of midfielders there. You had a half forward line then of David Beggy, PJ Gillick, and Colin Brady. And then a star studded full forward line for me. Captain Colin O'Rourke, Brian Stafford, a full forward, and Bernard Flynn, a corner forward. Like, you look at those two teams, Nathan, and I think if you're kind of comparing icons versus icons, that me team definitely edges it in terms of more high profile names. Yeah, well, that mead full forward line is as good as it gets. And maybe actually the entire game hung on the fact that Colm O'Rourke wasn't fully fit for the match. But yeah, it, again, it's just tough, tough men, every single one of them. Uh, like the, the context, uh, looking at the game, actually, one of the first things that stood out was uh, how cold it seemed to be. How cold? Jerry McIntyre looked absolutely frozen at the throw in. <laughs> I did not know like he was. It looked like he was shivering. Maybe he was just scared. <laughs> maybe maybe he knew the battle was to come I did like the fact actually from a uh, purely media if you knew Johnny McEntee that... lads you'd know that Johnny McEntee wasn't scared oh, I'll tell Tommy, you that much Tommy Rooney <laughs> how are you doing come on in hiya fellas how are you we're, we were just saying here that this me team on paper far more star started than Cork and it's an absolute disgrace that he didn't win this All-Ireland a disgrace that it didn't win this All-Ireland. So I, I have a good point to make on that when we get back to the sliding doors moment a little later on the Classic Game Club. Was it a disgrace? Look, if you look at the age profile, there was a good split in that mid-team. There's a lot of 20-year-olds, but there was a lot of lads who were quite old as well. Um, 
Uh, I don't know. Do you know what? Do you know what? It was a disgrace. The shooting on show that day was probably a disgrace. Brian Stafford is one of the best footballers in the country. Um, I watched it back last night. I couldn't believe the amount of frees he missed in the second half. Some of the bad decisions that were made. Nathan mentioned that Colin O'Rourke wasn't fit. Like, I think that's the only reason Cork snuck this one by a couple of points. Yeah, and that is it. They did sneak this. It's a terrible game, Tommy. Terrible, but like, but is it is it a, uh, is it a terrible like, sport? Is it sorry, terrible is too strong. First of all, that's definitely hyperbole. Is it indicative of the sport at the time, or is this a bad game? Even taking into the context of the early nineties, I, I think I think it's a bit of both. Um, when we said we were going to do this game, now a classic can be a classic for a number of reasons. It's not a classic because there's loads of goals. It's not a classic mm. because you know of the history around it as well. A classic can be a classic for any amount of reasons. And this one is a classic because if you heard, you mentioned earlier on the hardiness on show. This was a time when men were men. Nowadays, <laughs> what, what, does that fra- night, what does that phrase mean? Footballers, footballers are footballers nowadays. And men were men back then. Those lads weren't really playing football a lot of the time. The amount <laughs> of hoofs up the pitch. Um, and I think, I, I know actually an intercounty coach who has recently done uh a case study on Dublin Mead in 1991. He went back and he watched all four games. Um, and I'm going to try and get it on paper and bring it to air, the uh, the learnings that he found from that Dublin Mead um, saga and how it, the quality just wasn't there. Like So, like, when you're looking at some players on show, like, clearly, like, when Colin O'Neill broke through and smashed the ball off that crossbar, there isn't many footballers nowadays that do that. But, like, Brian Stafford's first point in that game, he, he strokes over loved above the outside of his point. There wasn't really much kicking like that. Bernard Flynn is a stylish footballer. But apart from that, there were, there were boots, just big old hoofs. Couldn't be wearing Doc Martens to put them over the bar. I disagree with you fundamentally on the lack, really? of, on the lack of stylish footballers. I think that this was indicative of the way footballers were instructed to play at that time. Like, you mentioned Conor Cunningham's stylish hair, Nathan. But look at the style of the footballer. Like, the utter grace that that man carried, Liam Hayes, the grace that he carried, just, like, okay. floating, floating above the turf. Oh, and just a good example on Cunahan there. There's a great moment in the second half towards the end where he sells two brilliant dummies, and then he fists the ball away. But that just doesn't, doesn't happen nowadays. <laughs> like, yeah, you might, you might say ro- Gaelic football is robotic now, but that was a 10-yard hand pass, and it just goes completely astray. I don't know whether the quality, maybe it was cold, as Nathan said. I, I, looking back in photos... I thought you said men were men, Tommy. Back there. What? I thought you said men were men. The calls shouldn't be affecting how these men play the game if you were saying that this was uh, an incredibly masculine time for getting football. Well, it was, uh, did you not think it was a masculine time? The hits that went on in that game were absolutely outrageous. They were, and they were fair. One question I want to ask before uh, we get into some of the categories here. Who would you run through a brick wall for, for first? Billy Morgan or Sean Boylan? Hmm. Sean Boylan. That suit he wore was unbelievable as well. Talk about style. Yeah, Boylan. Boylan every day of the week. Sean Boylan looks like he's uh, Jordan Belfort about to get onto his yacht in the Wolf of Wall Street. Like, he absolutely... Uh, flo- uh, like, God, he's got the, that style down, the, the shirt and the slacks. Billy Morgan, though, and the tracksuit, there's something a bit more terrifying about that. Like, I, I do love the, the sight of the two men sort of talking to their teams before throwing as if this is some sort of very calm, composed speech. And I'm sure what they're saying is said in a very calm and composed speech. But what they're clearly saying to their team is you need to go out there and absolutely murder your opponent. And that is mm. what, that, 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 that is Sean Boyle in a nutshell there, you know, uh, an unbelievably nice uh, man. And then his team would be sent out there to kill th- their opponent. But actually, does that really happen throughout this, except for the very obvious punch that happens? Was this not a, quite a clean game? Uh, th- th- there's a, what about all the slide tackles? Like, what 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 happened to that, that tackling technique that seemed to be prevalent back then, where you led with the feet first? That happened time and time again. Uh, I think it was a. It felt like a clean game because players, very much in contrast to now, took their punishment of a free. It, it was very very rare that a player complained. Like there was a respect for referees. It seemed uh, back then that so like, constantly in the first ten minutes it was free after free after free. But it just happened quickly. The player who gave away the free acknowledged he hit his man late. Move on. Whereas now mm. every single free is a surrounding the referee and it feels like it's a dirtier game. Yeah, it's a good point, actually. Um, we may take that point and go straight into moment of the match here. So uh, for anybody who's just joined us in the Classic Game Club, we've got a lot of different categories that we go through throughout uh, the duration of the podcast. Moment of the match is where we tend to start. And I'm going to lead this off by mentioning Colm O'Neill boxing the head off Mick Lyons. And boxing the head off McLeans doesn't do McLeans justice here because what happens is 
Colm O'Neill is done, what is it for, picking the ball off the ground? Mm. Or, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. yeah it's, some innocu- <laughs> it's some innocuous foul. Li- like, Lions come through <laughs> the back of him, like Lions fouls him. Like. Yeah, and, but like it's a, it's a free out, it's a bad call by the referee, who is Paddy Russell, by the way. Like me, Tommy, Meath people must love Paddy Russell. He, he essentially they got... absolutely he, do not love Paddy Russell. Paddy, I had a couple of people Russell. text me last night saying Paddy Russell ruined them in that game. Now, I wasn't sure looking back if that was the case, but Mead fans who'd watched it back in the 90s were telling me Paddy Russell ruined them about that day. Paddy Russell is the man who advised Pat McNenny to send, to send Lee McHale off. Let's not forget. Mead people yeah, must absolutely you know, love this referee. We're talking about 1990 here. We're not talking about 1996. It's all, it's all the one decade. Anyway, back to uh, Colm O'Neill. So Colm O'Neill gets a, a straight red card. After picking the ball off the ground, he's a little bit annoyed, so he just goes in with the inside of the fist, straight to the head of Nick Lyons, who barely flinches and is like, all right, I just got boxed in the head with a left hook there by a fairly big man, carries on with his business. As you say, people are actually just uh, able to get on with it, and Colm O'Neill gets a red card. For me, that is the summation of this game, the level of hardness you needed to have within you to even get an entry pass into one of these teams at the time. Yeah, I think um, that was my moment of the match as well. Because when you look at it first, it looks as though, from the initial camera angle, as though Colm O'Neill almost just flicks at him. But then you see a couple more angles, and he gives him a good thump. It's a and don't. It's just, a don't, lads. That's a don't. Kinda, he just kind of brushes it off. Yeah, fair. <laughs> I, I, Mick Lyons is probably as shocked as anybody else that Colm O'Neill was sent off. <laughs> no, he was not. For his lads, own no, Mick Lyons was not shocked that Colm O'Neill punched, don't give him a don't in the face. If you watch it back frame by frame, the free gets given. Okay. O'Neill doesn't whinge to the referee, but he kind of holds on to the ball. If you pause it there, Nick Lyons has the tongue out. He looks like that emoji who's about to pull a fast one. And he goes in and he gives O'Neill a bit of a dunk to the shoulder and he knows he's going to get a reaction. He gets punched in the face and he's delighted. There was nothing better than getting punched in the face back then. Red card. <laughs> there is- can, I just, can I just mention my moment of the match? And it happened yeah. about three frames after that. It's, it's the walk from Mick Lyons after that as he's walking away and that iconic number three jersey just shining in gold and his collar how his collar is just ruffled the way it is he honestly I couldn't make my mind up last night should he be replacing Pierce Brosnan as James Bond or should he be a Bond villain he was one or the other that's my moment of the match James Bond for me definitely definitely more of a a Bond man Uh, this is mentioned by Charlie Mulgrew in the aftermath of the game, Charlie Mulgrew there with his uh, notebook on the Sunday game is his unique side. But he's talking about that as well, that this is all a Mick Lyons master plan to get mm. Colm O'Neill sent off. I, th- I think we're giving him too much credit there, Tommy. No, you're not. You're talking about the, the greatest full-back uh, that has existed, apart from Darren Fay. He may... He may... He, <laughs> 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 he may... I love this mead bias. Uh, he, he made the best draw of uh, any footballer of the 90s, but I'm, I'm not giving him credit for actually wanting to wind Colm O'Neill up so that he would 100%. test his own jaw. 100%. 100%. That's what he's doing. Like, or else he's he thinking O'Neill's just going to take it like a man because men were men back then and he didn't take it like a man. If, if you wanted to go for a different moment in this match, the John Kerrin save in the second half would have to be up there in terms of an important moment of actual football that occurred. It's I, I can't even remember who gets the shot away, Tommy. I can't, I can't remember. Conor O'Rourke. I think it's Conor O'Rourke. Is it O'Rourke who gets the, the shot away in the end? Um, or is Beggy, no? But, um, anyway, it Beggy? It's, I, it's one of the It's one of the full forward line. It's either O'Rourke or Stafford who gets the shot away. But it comes from this unbelievable run from Liam Hayes, and this is like 40 minutes into the game. We haven't seen anything from Hayes. He's getting castigated at halftime in the analysis. Like We've seen loads of McEntee. We've seen loads of the two Cork midfielders. And then the fourth midfielder on the pitch, Liam Hayes, has been anonymous. And then all of a sudden he decides, right, mm. I'm going to show you all why I'm so highly rated. Just slaloms through about 20 Cork players and sets up the opportunity for Beggy, who should bury it. And at that point, that's back at the net. 15 men against 14, Meath win the All-Ireland. But John Kerrins pulls off this unbelievable save, which apparently, now I haven't watched the 1990 Hurling final back, is similar to a Jer Cullingham save that is made in the Hurling final. And these two moments uh, they are very symmetrical, that there is these two Cork goalkeepers winning the double for the county. For me, in terms of the competitive direction of the game, John Kerrins doesn't make that save, Meath score that goal, Cork do not win the double in 1990. It, it was a key moment. It was a massive moment. And um, it, it, it was actually the, the three-man weave is a drill that every club footballer in the country can now take a break from for the next however long we're out of this. But um, it was a perfect three-man weave as well because Kevin Foley was going off his left shoulder and he was open. So he could have slipped it to Foley inside. And of course, Foley's the man who puts the ball in the back of the net against Dublin the following year. 
So maybe that's history there, a sliding doors moment there, slip it to your left, and it's in the back of the net, and that's the All-Ireland for Mead in 1990. Potentially. Potentially you might be onto something there. Um, let's talk about the halftime show. Nathan, what are your takeaways from this? Oh, sorry, this is, this is the moment of the match. I think it the, probably is. The, the, sorry, the entire half time was, I was, when I was watching it back, about to start flicking through, and I thought there was something wrong with the YouTube page as I kept flicking past this Cadbury's <laughs> ad that, even though I was fast-forwarding, was still on. The Cadbury's <laughs> ad, they must have, this must have been Super Bowl levels of expenditure from Cadbury's in 1990. The ad must go on for three minutes. It has to and be. And nothing happens during it. It's just, it's just so oh, slow, no. sensual. It's salivating. It's, it's, I, wanted, I wanted a dairy milk more than I ever wanted one in my life last night. It's, it's unbelievable. It's an erotic chocolate ad. Mm. In yes. the middle of an All-Ireland final, it goes on for a good two minutes. Like, this is the 1990s, guys. This is, this is like, we're a very kind of um, conservative country at this point. This is not suitable for young eyes, this uh, Cadbury's ad. And uh, how long <laughs> it goes on for There's a lot of people who've seen things they've never seen before when they see that uh, Cadbury's ad at halftime. There was a hell of a lot of dairy in that ad break as well. A lot of dairy, a lot of milk. That was quite enjoyable. And then there's an ad for flora. I don't know whether we can call it butter or we call it uh, spread. I don't know what it is. Um, spread. What, what, what spread. else happens in the, the halftime show, Nathan? Uh, well, very little analysis, for starters. Uh, so Martin Carney's there, obviously, uh, as chief analyst, I presume, at that stage. Who was alongside him again? Charlie Mulgrew. Uh, Char Charlie, Mulgr Charlie Mulgrew was there, and uh, Charlie Mulgrew... Uh, literally looks like he was walking past the studio and they decided to Charlie come in here for five minutes we hear very <laughs> little from, we hear very little from either of them because we're sitting watching Declan Nurney mm. for a good seven or eight minutes I presumed when they came back that they would show the first 30 seconds and then they might have the music in the background but no we got the full Declan Nurney experience and he was loving it you can forget J-Lo as far as I'm concerned. Forget Shakira. It is all about Declan Ernie if you want a good halftime show. They pulled out all the stops for him. They have the current Artane Boys band, the 1991, and then the past Artane Boys band as well. They brought out two different Artane bands to satisfy uh, the musical needs of Declan Ernie at this point. It is big show band stuff in the middle of Crow Park, and he is wearing the most outrageous outfit you will ever see in all the colours of the rainbow on his tie. I don't know, it looks like it looks like Sergeant Pepper or something in the middle of the Corn Park page. Um, quite, quite, why, why don't we have this anymore? Why why has the halftime pageantry been taken away from the GEA? No, I think uh, maybe not the last couple of years, but they did have bands come on at halftime and play an old song. But like, know, that's because like you've like been in Croke Park for all Ireland finals recently, Nathan. People on TV don't get to see that. Oof. That's true. So should or, or should be broadcasting it. Like they like this is for me, this is the start of something great where it's like Declan and Ernie and this big band and uh, everybody waving their flags uh, at halftime for the GEA to turn around and say, how can we do this again? How can we go bigger and better over these next few years? Not that you can get any that's, bigger and better than Declan and Ernie, that is. That's, that's the thing, though. Like, the GEA 30 years ago, the GEA was potentially more futuristic than it is today. Like, what's the first thing Jerry Canning says in that YouTube commentary? Welcome to our British viewers on Channel 4. I didn't realise that. I didn't know that mm. the, the all Ireland final was broadcast on Channel 4 back in the day. Is that... Did everyone know that? Did you know that? No. No, no. Did, no I didn't. And, yeah, like, that's, that, that's something that stuck out to me as well. This, this seems something that is so perfectly of its time. If you told me, draw a sketch of the 1990 All-Ireland football final, I would probably draw exactly that. It is perfect in terms of the flags, in terms of the colours, in terms of the specific advertising that has been done around the stadium. It is just so perfectly 1990 and of its time. But you're right, there is like a, a GEA kind of leaning towards a more futuristic element. There is kind of inklings of a new Ireland. I know afterwards you have Larry Tompkins giving a shout out to everybody from San Francisco to London that there is still a huge diaspora of Irish people. Emigration is still a thing. And there are Cork people all over the world watching this thing that there is Ireland at a crossroads here getting used to erotic chocolate ads at halftime big uh, musical acts at halftime of a game and uber commercialism in certain areas as well it's an, it's an interesting was, snapshot of Irish life there was, a, there was also a moment before half time I don't know whether you could pick it up in the commentary and I'm not going to say the word but we all know the chant that was directed towards the referee and I presume it was the Cork fans because Colin O'Neill had just been sent off well you could also the hear referees, the referees uh, yeah, the, the, uh -oh. the, the, yeah. the referee's a wanker. You could, you could hear oh. the, uh, the Cork accent uh, through the chant. It was like Cork people singing in unison. The go on, give it, give, it, give it a go. Well, you know, I wouldn't... Uh, it's, what is it, 9.14 in the morning, it's grand. So I can't read really the Cork accent. The referee's a wanker. 
but I, I can't do a Cork accent. I, like, I can't say a Cork accent, I can't sing a Cork accent. But that was one Jesus, of the Everyone's Everyone's self isolated at home this morning. Nobody's <laughs> yeah, scared. Yeah. You've never had more people watching you, and that's what you have to come up with. You know, I'm pretty proud of that. Um, well, hey, what about the size of the men back then? They were huge. What are, look, Joe Castle's come on the field for Jerry McIntyre to start the second half, and I've never seen a man so big. <laughs> he is gigantic. I was like, who the hell is this man? Like, he is... But even, even the, the they, we're constantly putting up the weights of the players every time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that made me feel like, better about myself. Six, six foot two, 14 stone seven. Yeah. yeah welcome, welcome. I was like, bloody hell, I could have made it back then. And Jer Jerry McIntyre is six foot two, 12 stone. Like there is a varying degrees of weights amongst people of similar heights here. Uh, there's also like a, a big fella that comes on for Cork with a big knee brace. And I'm pretty sure there's nothing wrong with his knee. He's just trying to take the piss <laughs> out of uh, Colm O'Rourke <laughs> by wearing a knee brace. Like, there, like there's tons of things that come. Like your man Castles who comes on, it's, it's like one of those kids Disney movies where two kids stand on top of each other and put a big overcoat on it. I was pretty sure there was two human beings inside the Cork jersey at that point, uh, for, or inside the me jersey at that point. Um, right, let's move on to uh, secret man of the match. The actual man of the match was uh, Shea Fahey. Damn it. Uh, yeah, you've probably gone for him. Yeah. I had to, oh, I had so to Fahey, be a bit of lucky Fahey into this. But Fahey, I think, is the man who actually did get given man of the match that night uh, on the Sunday game. Um, I'm going to just kick this off, and I'm going to nominate Larry Tompkins because of the fact that one thing has never changed in Gaelic football, and that is the free taker, when it comes to it, in the business end of Gaelic football, will be your most important man on the pitch. And Larry Tompkins, in my view, is the most important man on the pitch on this occasion, just because of some of his unerring ability to put the ball over the bar at certain times, escaping the attention of multiple people time and time again, and kick two points after doing his cruciate in this game. So he said this a few years later, my knee took a wobble and my cruciate severed, but I hopped up quick, afraid Dr. Khan would come in and take me off. It was like someone had shot you. The pain was unreal. But then it went, and I just blanked it out of my head. If I was going to die, I was going to die there. He did his cruciate. He kicked two points. There is no way he is not the man of the match, in my eyes, in this game, Larry Tompkins. Yeah, I think uh, you can go along with that, particularly considering in the first half how poor the score-taking was. I mean, there was a surprise. Larry Tompkins didn't take the first free. They give, give it to Cullum O'Neill and put it wide, and he looked absolutely deflated. It was a battle day for Cullum O'Neill. He hit the crossbar as well in the first half. Mm. Uh, it just didn't happen for him. But yeah, Tompkins, in such a tight game, in such a terrible game of football, your free taker is always going to be absolutely crucial. And yeah, it's hard to disagree. For me, lads, uh, Dave Barry was my mm. secret man of the match. He uh, went about his business uh, quietly, but he was absolutely everywhere. He actually. I didn't realise that. I thought Sean Boyner maybe brought it in a couple of years later, the, the wing forwards that would drop deep and, and be everywhere. But um, he played a role like Brian Dewar or uh, Paul Gavin would have played in the 2000s. He was absolutely exceptional. And uh, I actually enjoyed following him, kind of bouncing off shoulders the way you would in, like, um, what's the name of the bumper cars? Like That's what the shoulders are like back then. You'd bump off one man onto another, and Dave Barry was just doing that the whole time. So he was my secret man of the match. The tackling was Good. Can we say that? I thought there were some good interceptions. Like, I see your eyebrows are raised, Tommy, uh, well, about this. I, I thought it was quality, like, as you say, like bumper cars. Good, clean shoulders quite a bit. I have uh, written down here six tackles that would be banned in rugby in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> go, go on, go shoot them. Do you have them? Do you have the six that, tackles or what, what were they like? They I, were I, like I there was them. like a shoulder to the head. There was uh, there was close, there was clotheslines. Um... There was just lads getting nailed left, right, and centre, and they just got up and got on with it. My, I really did enjoy the bumper car element of the shoulders, though. There's one moment I think I, uh, I put it up on Twitter accidentally, uh, a three-second video of a, a mead man fielding a ball between three cork lads and just bouncing between all three of them. Like it was just, it was comical, but it was brilliant. Um, Paul McGrath and Danny Cullity need a shout out, shout out for uh, man of the match here as well. I thought they were excellent. You got like you're not giving Tony McIntyre any love here, Tommy. Was he not one of the best Jerry, players? Jerry, Jerry McIntyre. Jerry, Jerry McIntyre, uh, sorry. Jer Jerry McIntyre, like, Jerry McIntyre started that game with the manic aggression that I could only aspire to have on a football pitch. It was absolutely unbelievable. I don't know whether he ran out of steam. I actually I actually put it out there. Was this peak Jerry McIntyre asking the question? Because I wasn't sure if it was or not. But he got taken off at half time. I'm not sure if there's an injury or, as Nathan said, maybe he was a bit cold. And I know Jerry, he wasn't cold. But... <laughs> um, I'm not sure what the issue was, but he started it really well. But as we said, Shea Fahey was the actual man of the match. Hayes had a quiet game. Fahey ran the show. Um, in terms of uh, off-the-ball um, qualities, Jerry McIntyre, though, was 10 out of 10. 
yeah, he was he was pretty good. I just have a note here, lads, because I, I feel like I said earlier on that the quality wasn't as good, and I don't think I backed it up um, when I said it. But it was just a moment that summed it up for me towards the end of the game. It was after Cairns' save, and Mead were chasing the goal. And uh, Colin O'Rourke hoofs it from uh, around 45 over towards the sideline. And it goes over Colin Coyle's head, over his shoulders. Coyle receives it, turns his man, and hoofs it back over towards the square. Now, you can tell from the way that Coyle has hooked the ball from the sideline that the ball is going nowhere near the square. It ends up about 25 yards from the goal and in a cork man's hand. But Jer Canning says, very good-looking ball as the ball leaves Colin Coyle's boot. <laughs> and if that's the standard that they were judging at back in 1990, and if that's what was good and a good-looking ball, well, then I think we have to say that the quality is slightly improved these days. And you have the likes of Michael Murphy and Paul Flynn kicking the ball the way that they do. Canning does lose his shit entirely as well when somebody uh, completes a 20-metre kick pass yeah. at, at one stage. And it's like, uh, like actually picking out a man and kicking the ball to him is just not something that you do in Gaelic football. Speed trumps everything. Oh, there was there was no picking out a man at any stage. Like Mick Lyons, uh, very early does what great fullback does, and he rises up inside the square and he collects the ball. And you're thinking nowadays a fullback would just look to his side and hand pass out, and you try and build from deep. He gives it the most almighty welly. He kicks it from pretty much his own goal line to up on the halfway line, and that was his job. Like, but gives it straight to a court player. But it doesn't matter because he's got rid of it. Um, do you know? Do you know? It actually, lads. The game actually gave me more of an understanding of the lads that we know. And I'm not going to say my old fella does the same, but he's been guilty of shouting it before. Let it in. He's been guilty of shouting yeah. that on the sideline quite a bit. And there's plenty of other men around the country and women around the country who are guilty of saying let it in as quick as you can. I can understand why they wanted to let it in because it worked back then. Because it was a bit like hurling, let's say. Now. I might get in trouble in the office if I said this. I'm gonna. I'm in the sanctity of an empty fifth floor here in Marconi House. But yeah, no, yeah, you can definitely. It's a bit it. like skill levels in hurling right now. You just hit it as far as you can to the corner and let the lads work away at it. That's what it was like. Let's clip that. Tommy Rooney <laughs> says modern day hurling is as uh, unrequiring of skill as 1990s football is. Thank you for that soundbite, Tommy Rooney. Let's We're gonna need to... soundbites, lads, up in the next few weeks. L I'm here. Let's uh, roll on to trending. The trends that we noticed from 1990. There are loads here. I will. I'll leave you to it, Nathan. If you want to kick this off. Ah, uh, well, the amount of kicking was uh, the obvious trend uh, in the game. Um, freeze. For the first time, I think they were saying you could kick freeze from the hand. It was just recently brought in. For but some again, freeze. Even still, even there were loads of freeze been taken off the ground from like deep inside their own half. But again, it just fed into the hoof it forward as far as you could. Like there was no, if you had a free inside your own half, you weren't trying to work something. You were just trying to kick it as deep as you could mm -hmm. into the opposition half. Uh, one of the things, maybe it's not the trending, is how bad Meath were in that first half. They were absolutely brutal. They had a one five or six minute spell, but but for a team that you like reflect on has been a, as a as a great team who'd won a couple of All Ireland titles, like they were shockingly bad. Uh, Colin O'Rourke, just like thirty three at that stage, knee not right, but you could just see the flickers of genius from time to time from him. It, like, I think we're probably all in agreement if he was fit, it's a it's a different result. Yeah, but like I don't buy the whole fitness thing for Colin O'Rourke this day. Like his issue was his radar. Like he won uh, a few good balls, and he he had two shocking wides in the game, Tommy. I'm sure I'm sure even you'll agree. With that. Did you see the noise, the the size of the knee brace on? Mm. Gin ginormous. Obviously, that's going to knock off the radar, like. Okay, maybe it will. Maybe it will. But I I just don't see how you can actually be as involved as he is in the game because he does get a good few touches on one leg. And if you like, you're suggesting it was that bad. If you can't kick the ball over the bar, then you can't really run and get the ball, unless the man who is marking him, unless Niall Cahalan. Well, maybe not Callan is quite slow, but uh, like I, I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I think that that was perhaps a little bit overpaid. Um, the, uh, the other trend I would take uh, from this morning is that Tommy Rooney can't talk about Mead football without going into full-on Mead accent. I've never heard him speak <laughs> like this before. That actually, I actually didn't realise that it happened, but uh, it happens to me every time I go home. Well. Tommy, what, what other trends do you have? Hi. Hi. Is that uh, how you do it? I my know, trend, but... lads. My trend, uh, look, quickly, slight tackles. I'm not saying to bring them back, but it was refreshing to see them. Um, but <laughs> the other trend I have, and it's a difficult one to, to explain, it's, it's the juxtaposition of styles that were on show. Like nowadays, people turn up in the same tracksuits. They wear the same gear. You know, various players are sponsored, but most of them all look 
players look fairly similar nowadays. Do you know what I mean? But back then, you had, as you said earlier on, Billy Morgan in his tracksuit, Sean Boyle in his white suit. You had um, Mick Lyons looking like James Bond compared to Niall Cahalan, who looked like he would just have to come out of a bush. Um, <laughs> Bernard, Bernard Flynn. Bernard Flynn. I, I have a lot more... A lot more um, uh, of an understanding of how good a footballer Bernard Flynn was after watching this. And Bernard Flynn was a stylish corner forward. He was a pin-up corner forward back in the 1990s. Like, Bernard Flynn, but, but his Bernard style, Flynn looks better his now running, than he his grace. <laughs> he, actually, he, actually does. he actually does. One man I had never seen before. I actually don't think I've ever seen Martin Carney before until I saw him in half-time. I've only ever listened to him. Really? So yeah, mean, I was like, right I was like who is that? Who, who is in the studio with Charlie McGrew? I didn't know that, Charlie, that uh, Martin Carney looked like that. How is that possible? You've like never he's... seen Martin Carney before. <laughs> I don't think. Well, maybe it's because it's thirty years ago. He just looks completely different. But he doesn't. I actually... just didn't realize that that was what Martin Carney looked like back in the... Like Michael Lester doesn't look any different, really. Like... Ah, he don't... Michael Lester is a handsome bastard in the year nineteen ninety. Yeah, I'm saying he doesn't look any different nowadays. But True. Martin Carney, I, I, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have known him. Anyways, That's the juxtaposition right. of styles. Colin Coyle's Under Armour. Yes. Uh, I don't know whether it was the Under Armour skins. back then or it was just a big pair of boxers, but like they were blue. Why were you wearing blue Under Armour with a green jersey? You don't do that. Because you're everyone knows you don't do that. You've got to, you know, match up the colours here. Some players did it, some players didn't. So that was my thing. The juxtaposition of styles, and it was pretty refreshing to see that everyone was their own man. Back when men were men. I think the evolution of shorts in the GEA has gone on like a little bit of a curve where like they started off in the very old grainy footage where they're quite low and then they reach kind of a peak where they get unbelievably short and then they've come back to being lowish now. That peak where they're at their shortest is at this very game, 1990 All Ireland Football Final, Mead against Cork. There's one fella, I think it's the Mead centre back, who is wearing his jersey tucked out, and you can't even see his shorts. You can't even see his shorts because they're so short. That is what the trend Uh, is. Short shorts are absolutely all the rage. That like Colin Coyle is obviously uh, astonished by how short the shorts were, and that's why he put on his blue skins and the Nito shorts. So uh, that's what I took from trending. Uh, In terms of uh, most jarring. We kind of mentioned these uh, a, a good bit already. Uh, no play acting, no malaise really at any point uh, in the game. A lot of hoofing, as we've said. The freeze off the ground, the flags. But like just up on the freeze off the ground, is the ball heavier? Because it looks heavier. It looks like a lot of them are struggling to get elevation on the ball. Or maybe, maybe... Uh, weirdly, I thought that they felt like they could hand pass it about twenty yards further than the current players can. But yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think yeah, you're giving them a get out of jail free card there because I think the shooting was just terrible. Can I make one point on that? The kicking the freeze off the ground uh, because it was enforced. A lot more players had to do it back then. Like nowadays, you can be guaranteed that you might only have three players on a football team who kick a ball over the bar from 45 yards. So you might actually, if everyone was forced to kick the ball off the ground, you might see a lot more players struggling to get it that far. It's true. Yeah, I, I just don't understand why. There just wasn't better off the ground kicking when off the ground freeze were the thing at the time. Like you would have thought, it just didn't. I just thought that there was moments where the skill execution was fairly good. I don't think power was an issue for these lads. And just to see a lot of these off the ground freeze just be completely, completely fizzle out wide. Maybe the surface wasn't as good in Croke Park as well. I, I don't know, but it, it looked fine to me. Uh, so that's something kind of uh, stuck out to me. Um, we're going to move on then, to, uh, kind of to, to our final section here, to the sliding doors, which kind of gets into the context of this. I'm not. I'm not sure what to to make of this. I'm not sure whether this is a huge triumph or not for Cork that they end up doing the double in 1990, and then the decade ends up becoming a year of huge turbulence in both codes. That surely, if you're a Cork fan there in September 1990, you're like, right, this is going to be the year for Cork. And what they they, they win a, a, another All Ireland in either code before the end of the decade? Like this is this is surely a, a, a nosedive in expectations from Cork from where they are at this moment. It's peak Corkness, is it, 1990? Well, I would have thought so, but like, it's peak mm. Corkness then not to step up and say, right, well, we're going to dominate both of these sports. We are, we, we're the big boys now, and we can do it in, in both codes. And then, is peak Corkness not to put yourself in a position of uh, yep. greatness been just around the corner and then to self-sabotage? Yes, sorry, I see what you're saying. Of course it is, of course it is. Well, sorry, peak Corkness yeah. would be being on the right side of arrogance. Of course, Corkness would never come into play with why they didn't win uh, another few All-Irelands. But like I, I don't know, like what what is what is the context of this game? Like is it like is it a situation where Meath like come back and like it takes them a while, Tommy? I think you'll admit for them to get back well, to this level again. Yeah, well, well look, I I did a bit of a, a study last night because I knew this question was going to come up because it's one of our topics, and 
uh, after a bit of kind of work with, with mathematics and a bit of uh, equations and science, I'm obviously not using my words very well here, What the, the sliding doors moment, the result ultimately of me losing the 1990 All-Ireland football final to Cork is that they beat Mayo in 1996. And that would not have happened. Mayo would have their All-Ireland title if Cork had lost that day in Mead Expl- one. Explain yourself. It forced, it forced a transitional period in Mead football we had an unbelievable minor team coming through. There was another 21 uh, medals won as well. And it forced Sean Boylan to push out the, the legends of the late 80s um, and the early 90s. And over the next couple of years, they were phased out. And by 1996, you had Tommy Dowd, you had Ollie Murphy, uh, you had New Blood. You had a lot of them now in and um, Darren Fay. Like a lot of those boys were in by that stage. And that is the only reason. Not Paddy Russell. Well, maybe he is Paddy Russell. Maybe if Paddy Russell had given me a few more frees that day and had beaten them in 1990, Mayo would have their All-Ireland. Well, uh, I'll uh, hand this over to you, Nathan. Uh, well, I think it's a bit much to associate the events of September 1990 with the outrageous cheating of the Mead team six years later. Like maybe cheating. the roots of it were in cheating. that match. It was a fight. Uh, it was a row. Yeah, instigated by the Mead players to try and get Mayo's best player sent off. Hold on a second. Owen's neutral, and he's done a documentary on it. Owen, was this cheating by Mead in 1996? I'd, I would say Mayo were very hard done by. Yeah. No, thank you. But it's not cheating. Yeah. Cheating is a very specific word here, lads. Yeah, we've like you've made such a horrendous point. You've actually lost Nathan Murphy. His Skype line has gone down no, because you're you're, you're talking honestly, so much. Honestly, it's about not that bad a point. It's not that bad a point. That game, that Mead losing, forced the transitional period in Mead football, and it led to their dominance in '96 and '99, getting the three All Irelands in the following decade. Cork, as you said. They sat on their 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 history winning year and they went into the doldrums for 10 years. Meath won the All-Ireland in 1996 because they were good enough to pick up one in what was a ragtag decade. Everybody who was good enough won an All-Ireland in the 1990s in both codes. Apologies, by the way, to any Cork hurling fans out there. I forgot about the 1999 hurling final, which, of course, Cork managed to win. Absolute classic, 13 points to 12 against Kilkenny. Somehow that slipped my mind when I said that they'd uh, a fat uh, decade. So they did it. And Meath, Meath, Meath obviously bet Cork in the 99 All-Ireland football final as well. There you go, actually, yeah. So um, that least you got back to finals in, in both codes throughout the decade. But I, I just think that, I don't know, like I, I don't know what this game tells us about the decade as a whole, but what we do know is that the following 10 years were a bit weird. They were great, but they were weird. We saw the emergence of a number of Ulster counties as legitimate contenders for successive years after that. Changed the landscape entirely in terms of how the whole country viewed Ulster football. But then it's very telling when you look at that 1990 final that the first thing we all said about it was the hard edge. This was the All-Ireland final where we're like, right, this is a tough game. You'd want to be able to handle yourself going out into that pitch. And the one thing that the Ulster counties managed to do was handle themselves going out into that pitch. So I think what this tells us about football at this point is that what matters more than anything else is your attitude and your determination and your ability to show a bit of grit. And that is why Ulster Counties were so successful over the course of the 90s. And it's probably also why nobody managed to go back to back because there was always a county beside you who was going to be more hungry to come back the following year and knock you off your perch. So like, that's my theory on what this whole thing represents. I think it's a snapshot of a great rivalry between Cork and me that's time. But the legacy yeah. of it is that toughness is going nowhere in Gaelic football. It is going to be everywhere for the for the rest of the decade. And really, beyond that, when you look at how Tyrone and Armagh emerge in the, in the following decade. Mm. Yeah, it was the end of a, an unbelievable rivalry between Mead and Cork, I think, in 1990. Um, and as you said, I'm really looking forward to actually looking back at the Ulster, the Ulster All-Ireland wins over the next couple of years in the early 90s. Because that down team were unbelievable to watch back then. I've seen one of the All-Ireland finals, the 91 one recently, and I'm looking forward to watching it back again. Let's go through the All-Ireland winners that year. Was it Down 91, Donegal 92, Derry 93? Did Down do it again in 94? Down again in I 94, yeah. And then you've got Dublin, Dublin Mead, Kerry, Galway and Mead, Mead again. Like, that's that was unbelievable how it was shared back then. I know it was known as revolution years in hurling. What was it in football? It wasn't. It obviously wasn't the devolution years, but like, what what was it? <laughs> Well, well uh, I don't know, we'll come, we'll come up with some sort of fancy name for that. Who, who was the team of the decade of the of the 90s? D- Downer Meath, if you're, if you're going by All-Ireland's one, it's got to be one of the two of them, doesn't it's it? It's going to be Meath, isn't it? Because it's gotta, it's, they got the well, Mead, finals. And they kind of spread it across both sides of the decade. Down were only in the early 90s. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm completely wrong about that. And Down had an unbelievable team in the late 90s and they were just unlucky. But there's no sign of any Ulster sides after 94. Oh, um okay. Well, I suppose there's Tyrone in 95. Who did Kerry beat in 97? Mayo. He's not back, is he? Uh, he's not, no. 
Okay, okay. I'd say his phone died. He's been on the phone for the last two hours co-hosting the show. We're going we're to wrap up very shortly, but I completely agree with your point about if you're bookending a decade, then you're at a team of the decade. Just like, for example, if a team were to win the 2000 All-Ireland and say, I don't know, the 2009 All-Ireland, they are definitely the team of the 2000s. What team well, was those two All-Ireland? Well, that was a, oh, that was a Sorry. very different anyway, decade. That's uh, a, a debate that obviously has been well hammered on the show before. Over or underrated, Tommy, the 1990 All-Ireland football final? Uh, completely underrated because when we said we were going to do this game um, Kieran Shannon got back and David Sheehan got back to, in LFM, LMFM and both lads warned me and said you're not going to enjoy this one um, for the quality and show and now at times I'm going to say at times the quality was putrid at times it was good but the thing is the excitement level maintained like I watched this game last night at 10 o'clock I should have been going to bed it was actually on live on Air Sport at the same time as we, we watched on YouTube completely randomly. I actually ended up watching the second half on Air Sport. I would watch it on YouTube just for the the uh, the halftime analysis alone. But as I said, the quality wasn't great, but the absolute excitement throughout, the hardiness, the history around it, I think this final is actually underrated. Well, I'm going to actually judge this on what the game was, and it's it's overrated. Like the game, the game is clearly overrated. When you nobody, nobody rates it. Nobody thinks it's a good All-Ireland final. Uh, I definitely, I personally did. When when you talk about Cork Mead, you're like, oh, great games of the the late eighties. Actually, that's nonsense. They're not, they're not great games. It's not a great game. It's a great era. It's a great team, and there are great characters, and there's great toughness. And as an occasion, and as an enjoy, I would actually say as an enjoyable experience, it's a little bit underrated. I didn't know that you could actually enjoy. A turgid affair as much as you possibly could, and maybe turgid is a bit strong. But I think as a contest, I think as an actual game, as a classic game, which is what we're here to rate, Tommy, I think it's overrated. I just, I just don't think, it, I just don't think it was very good. But at the okay. same time, there's such an enjoyable charm to it. Um, and when was uh, the last time you didn't fast forward a halftime analysis when you had the chance? When was the last time I didn't? You couldn't like you like you wouldn't be able to fast forward this. It was just it, it was, well, it was remarkable. The, I, I'm judging on the whole occasion. Early. Okay, I know it's the classic game club. We're talking about the game. Are we going to give the game a rating? Yeah, give it give me a rating there. I'm going for a six. Uh, on the quality of the game. Yeah. Four. Four. Okay. So I've actually rated the game hard. Overall, overall eight. Quality four. Um, the reason why we didn't fast forward half time, Tommy, is because of Declan Ernie and the colourful mm. tie and the tunes absolutely bopping in the middle of uh, the field. Uh, is there any final thoughts, Tommy, before we wrap? Uh, I just really enjoy it. If anyone is at a loose end over the next couple of weeks, if anyone has a bit of spare time in their hands, you could do a lot worse than going back and watching the 1990 All Ireland final. And if you do that, get in touch. Let us know. Um, let us know what you think in terms of Secret Man of the Match or the trending topics. I, I actually, I loved it seeing Dr. Khan appear in the field every so often. Um, I really enjoyed the shoulders, the punts, the hoofs, the shite solos. Um, it was good crack. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a good way to sum it. It's very, very good crack. Watch Back Yourself is all available on YouTube for anyone who hasn't seen the game. All the rest of our classic game club episodes as well, available on youtube.com forward slash off the ball right now. This is about episode seven, Tommy, I think. Uh, we're going to have yeah. another one for you tomorrow morning. It's going to be Celtic against Rangers from the year 2000, the 6-2 game for Celtic. That'll be your St. Patrick's Day classic game club tomorrow. If you've got any suggestions as well, tweet us at off the ball, tweet Tommy or I. If you want to get in touch with us personally about any classic games that you may have watched, that you may see on YouTube or in Daily Motion or somewhere online, and we'll watch them back and review them here in the Off the Ball studio. That is our lot this morning for OTV AM. Thanks for that, Tommy. Uh, Nathan, of course, uh, lost his battery there a little bit earlier on. We're back uh, tomorrow morning. Make sure to follow us at Off the Ball uh, to keep tuned to what we've got coming up tonight on the radio from 7 o'clock. Off the Ball will be live as well. Before you wrap this morning, here is Damien Delaney talking about Paolo Maldini. Good luck for now. Were you a student of the game in the way Rooney was? Were you watching tape? Were you studying other players? Yeah, it was, especially when I was um, when I was younger. Um, before I became a centre half, really, I played a, a lot of football at, at like left back or central midfield. Actually, this season playing central midfield uh, in League One one year, um, and I always thought that if I could learn as many positions as I possibly could, it gave me as many chances to to play. Whereas if I just kind of pigeonholed myself as to be a centre back, if a club already had two really good centre backs, well, then you're kind of um, killing yourself really so I thought well you know they've got two centre backs I'll go and learn how to play left back uh, so I played left back for a season when I was at Hull I played centre midfield for a season when I was at Hull and I learned how to play left side of three centre backs as well but very similar to what he was saying there um, you know you go on YouTube um, and you watch video and tape and, and that's the way there's no excuse for any young player now uh, with the advent of, of YouTube you can go and 
put anybody's name into YouTube and you're going to get clips. You know, so I remember watching clips of Paolo Maldini and things like that, learning positioning. Ashley Cole was another big one. We just learned, you know, defensively, where were they? How did they position themselves? Uh, and then when I was playing midfield, I just studied midfield players. Because um, I think if you can play as many positions as you possibly can, you give yourself as many, you know, potential mm. opportunities to play football. Fascinating. You're right. Okay. So Maldini. <laughs> yeah, I know. As I was saying that, I realised you were going to come back at me and say. <laughs> and did you know? Did you just watch it the once, or uh, if, you, did, if, <laughs> if you get clipped of Holland all four, you'll see similarities. <laughs> Is that right? Okay, that was the one. Player of the year that year, I, I seem to remember. Yeah, exactly, you? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> OTB. AM. This is OTB Sports Radio.